Good morning. Uh, we start a program today. May I ask Dr. Debashish Dash, Honorary Secretary of SWB, to come and give his inaugural speech. Debashish, thank you. A very good morning to all of you. We welcome you all to Shauhumi Rangomancho for a brilliant session today for everybody. Today, I have come with a very specific agenda in mind, not only the welcome address, but I'd like to harp upon that in, we in OSWB in a survey has found out that of all the ophthalmologists who are in West Bengal, only 60% are our member society. That means going the other way around, another 40% of ophthalmologists who are practicing in West Bengal are not our members. So I'd like to highlight what do we achieve by being a member of our society? So, I feel as an ophthalmologist, OSWB is an appropriate niche. What we call in Bengali, Kulungi. Kulungi te amra amader jinish patro jeta ko preserve kore rakhi sheta rakhi. So, a niche is a Kulungi. And OSWB is the niche for all the ophthalmologists is West Bengal. So, basically, the question raised by the non-members is why to be a member at all? This I am basically directing to all the non-members in particular and also to our members who can spread the message all across such that our membership increases multiple folds. So what, what are the facilities we give as a member of the society. You will be getting access to the top-notch masterminds in ophthalmology who are basically the thought leaders today, not only at the state level, but also at the national level. We do have the most updated scientific contents which are being regularly discussed and analyzed, which will be beneficial for everyone concerned. You will be eligible to undertake the observership programs in any institution of your choice of specialty with your choice of consultants. You will be eligible to undertake the leadership development programs which is being organized with the national faculties. You can participate in the competitive paper presentations, poster presentations, e-posters, and video sessions in all the conferences. The winners from these sessions are always selected to present at the national level. You can participate in the international CME programs of the society. So next month, we are having the Collaborate 2023, where 37 of our members are participating in the program in Cox Bazar. That's from June 21st to 24th. Thereafter, we have a Vietnam trip is being planned in the month of November this year. You will get access and a hard copy of the Journal of the Ophthalmological Society of West Bengal. This is being prepared by the Walter Kluwers and is going to have an RNI number, which will enable us to be a peer-reviewed journal very soon. And only the members will get the privilege of publishing their articles in the journal thereafter. You will get access to the Optabuzz, the in-house newsletter of OSWB, both in the e-form and a hard copy. You will get access to be a member of the elite photography group of OSWB, those who are passionate about photography. You will get access to be a member of the niche fine arts group named Canvas, indulging in fine arts and publishing an e-mag for the members to canvas their drawings. You will get access to the preferred practice patterns being prepared by the society in order to have an access to the practicing patterns to be followed by the members. This can be documented as a medical legal guideline, if need be, in the court of law. You can participate in the cultural events of the society. We do have our own ballroom dance classes for our members, and the members are free to join the session at any point of time. You can participate in our sports activities. We have our schedule of cricket, badminton, football, and bowling events to be announced in its correct time. You can participate in the yoga and the meditation classes being organized for the members from time to time. 
We do have a super specialty groups in various departments, as for example, we have already initiated the retinoblastoma, the retinopathy of prematurity, and the oculofacial aesthetics. Members willing can join in any of these groups to enhance their knowledge in the latest state-of-the-art methodologies in vogue. You can participate in the scientific programs and the district outreach programs being held every month in more than one locations. You can organize community ophthalmology eye screening camps with the help of our support system with an ever agile support to you anywhere in West Bengal. So with that, I do say, do join the movement, do enjoy this roller coaster ride. Thank you. Thank you, Devashish. Uh, OSWP today, under the able leadership of Dr. Rotish Chandrapal, Dr. Devashish Dash, and Dr. Rupak Kanti Bishash, has arranged an academic extravaganza for you. And to guide us through this journey this morning, we have two stalwarts, Dr. Kustabita uh, Katoch and Dr. Mahmoud Shahid Alam. I seek your blessings and your indulgence today to ensure that you finish our program on time. So the floor is all yours, Shahid and Savita. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I welcome you all for this symposium on ocular trauma. So, beauty of the face is defined by eyes and those of the eyes by eyelids. So any scar or distortion of the eyelid structure dents the confidence of an individual. So eyelid lacerations have to be responded in such a way that both its functional and aesthetic components are restored. So to make us well versed with all the do's and don'ts of management of eyelid trauma, we have amongst us Dr. Raka Chatterjee, who is a consultant, cataract and oculoplasty services at Sushrut Eye Research Foundation, Kolkata. Dr. Raka Ch Chatterjee. Yeah, okay. Uh, to discuss the session, we have amongst us Dr. Saurabh Sanyal, who is Director, Citizen Eye and Healthcare Center, Kolkata. Sir, uh, please take your uh, seat on the stage. And we have two expert panelists, rather three. Professor uh, Chandana Chakrabarti, she is quite uh, experienced oculoplasty surgeon and an associate professor at Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Kolkata. And uh, then we have Dr. Sanchita Roy, who is cons consultant, orbit and oculoplasty at Priyambada Bela Arvind Eye Hospital, Kolkata. So Dr. Raka, yeah, we can start with the management of eyelid trauma. Good morning, everybody. As you all know that eyelid injuries are very common an ophthalmologist faces in his day-to-day -day practice. And in this current age of medical legal concerns, it is very essential to have standard approaches regarding the assessment, the care that uh, we can provide in our center and uh, timely referral to the higher centers. These eyelid injuries can be isolated trauma or can be a, a, a part of a complex facial injuries. And these are very common. And there are different types of lead injuries and uh, we've, uh, like contusion, abrasion, avulsions, and lacerations. And these eyelid injuries can occur following road traffic accidents, following domestic violences, following acid burns, following hit burns, thermal burns, etc. Stable neurologic and cardiopulmonary status should be ensured. Complete ophthalmic examination is the next step and proper eyelid evaluation. The lid margin defects and the non-lid margin defects because the management will differ. Presence of canalicular injury, whether there is any levator muscle injury or not, orbital septum is involved or not. And whenever we encounter a laceration, its length, depth, shape, location is required. The treatment of isolated eyelid injury includes tetanus prophylaxis, as in all cases of uh, cutaneous wound, systemic antibiotics. Now, uh, when the question of surgery comes, the sequence of repair is first, the canalicular reconstruction and the 
cantha reconstruction second one is the repair of lead margin injury and the third is the repair of extra marginal injury the principles of repair yes it's true as is seen in other uh, cases of skin injuries with thorough cleaning of wound and removal of any foreign particles not de tissue debridement to be avoided the anatomical uh, configurations to be aligned first and it will be a layered repair starting from the deeper layer achievement of complete hemostasis and regarding the margins of the wound it should be elevated inverted not inverted and with the minimal tension if there is orbital septal injury it ha it should not be re repaired but levator lacerations are to be sutured now if there is full thickness lead lacerations depending on the tissue loss different methods we follow i'll show some cases this first case specially concentrate on the upper lead it's a superficial abrasion yes we uh, didn't go for any surgery only conservative approach was adequate but this patient the lower lead if you note it is a lead marginal defect it was a case of deep laceration following road traffic accident a very very badly damaged eye and the lead and the periocular tissue in the first sitting we just did a primary repair and uh, despite of lot of tissue loss we could achieve the anatomical reconstruction the further cosmetics and the functional things were done later this is a case of eyelid margin injury following a uh, road traffic accident as well now after the pre operative and the post operative photographs now as you see the lid margin injury the three suture technique was followed as is shown in the diagram this was a child who came with the lid margin tear and the canalicular injury the canalicular injury is not my scope of discussion today but after repair the post operative result was like this and the patient was very good the sixth case is a patient had a pet dog at home and it was a lead avulsion following dog bite now after the repair the patient had a ptosis we did the ptosis correction later on now apparently such an ugly looking wound we could manage to give the child a cosmetically acceptable appearance but it is not always the case as is seen here it was a completely avulsed eyelid from the medial canthus and uh, the patient when came to the outdoor there was lot of orbital fat preseptal fat prolapsed outside so those could not be restored we just sutured it and post operatively in the uh, first post operative day this one there was a canalicular injury as well but the tube had come out and there was a conjunctival prolapse but after a month this was the post operative picture with the scarring here little uh, stiffness of the eyelids further managements were done later the post operative care the ice compress the head end to be elevated antibiotics suture removal for lead margin 10 to 14 days 2 weeks and for non lead margin is average 5 to 7 days after the repair we remove the stitches to conclude these are the common injuries where careful assessment and meticulous repair is essential identification of the red flags that means there are certain conditions where you are supposed to refer the case to a specialist person who is experienced in handling the cases especially the lead margin injuries injuries involving the septum in, involving the levator and the complex facial or eyelid injuries injuries associated with fractures and has to be referred thank you very much so good morning everybody and thank you very much oswb for giving me an opportunity to uh, briefly give you some take home message on lead injury because the whole trauma symposium is quite big and each part if we take more time then uh, you need two days to completely cover up trauma so management of lead injury uh, raka has already briefed you about that i will give you six basic take home for primary surgeon 
It is not for the oculoplastic surgeons. It is for the surgeons who are dealing with the case primarily in a peripheral setup, tertiary setup, or in their own practice. Examine and treat the patient for all injuries. Delay and repair until conditions are favorable. I'll elaborate each. Remove all dirt and foreign bodies. Reposition the tissue as accurately as possible. And do not excise or discard tissue. This is, these last two are very important. Delay major reconstruction. Because you, we have a tendency that in first go we will do everything and make the wound perfect and the lead perfect. But that is not possible always. If there is a massive tissue loss, you cannot do that. So the points are, the eyelid injury may be isolated as uh, pointed by Raka, but it can be a part of major trauma. I remember this very well because we lost one patient. We repaired the lid, the patient had a mandibular fracture. It was not that evident during that time. We sent the patient in the ward and the patient developed laryngeal edema and choking after one hour and patient died. So we have to consider tracheostomy in those cases, especially uh, afterwards we will have major session on facial trauma. So please remember that, keep the airway, check the airway. We lost one patient. It was a lead injury, but occult trauma, mandibular fracture and the laryngeal edema. So full general examination, including x-ray, CT, MRI, USG abdomen, thorax, everything to be ordered if you are a primary treating physician in a peripheral hospitals. Because medical legally, if the patient dies, you are responsible as an MBBS doctor first. Then you are an eye surgeon. A full ocular examination, there may be occult trauma inside, maybe occult scleral rupture behind, maybe an optic nerve injury, you don't know. A good anesthetic backup is always necessary in these cases. Second point, delay the repair until conditions are favorable. Do not hurry to repair the wound. The result of eyelid repair not prejudiced by waiting for up to 48 to 72 hours. You can delay the repair up to 48 to 72 hours. You can consult a senior. You can call upon somebody. You can talk to a general surgeon and then you plan. Because if you do it hurriedly and send the patient home, there may be a lot of post-trauma deformities afterwards. So until the condition is favorable, don't try to repair the wound. Remove all dirts. Every attempt should be made at initial repair to clean the wound thoroughly to prevent subsequent tattooing, some marks, some foreign body inside, all these things. And remove all foreign bodies. Reposition the tissue as accurately as possible. As Raka pointed out, you have to know the anatomy very well. And if you frequently do lead surgeries, then only you will be identify the tarsal plate, the levator, or there is any other associated canalicular injury and everything because it comes, nothing will be identifiable at the first go. So you have to examine thoroughly under microscope, reposition it, the tissues, give three, four cardinal sutures and then you see what is happening. If you start repairing from the go that I will start repairing from this and finish up there, you will not be able to do that. You will have to first replace everything and cardinal sutures are placed, then you start repairing. So it takes time for a lead injury to repair. And second point, that wound should not be extended to explore the structures that may not be damaged. We have a tendency that we explore the wound. That why, what happened to the levator complex, let's see, because an avulsion, don't do that. Those things can be dealt later on, unless the exploration is for a suspected foreign body. If you have something in X-ray or CT and you find out something, you can explore, otherwise don't do. Do not excise or discard tissue. This is the principle of lead injury because the face is a very vascular structure. Even a small pedicle can make the tissue survive. So do not try to excise a pedicle, do not try to debride the tissue much. So this excellent blood supply in the face and eyelid region often allows tissue to survive as a free graft. But any pedicle should be preserved as far as possible. It is not usually necessary to cut and freshen the wound margin in lead injury. I can take some more time because Raka has finished uh, before. Yes, sir. Sure. 
delay major reconstruction. Preferably do not add tissue at the primary repair unless the cornea is seriously at risk. This is very important that you on the first go you try to give some graft, don't do that unless there is an exposure of the cornea. It is better to wait for the wound to settle for three, six, even nine months. Then you can go for a definitive surgery like your uh, lead sharing procedures or a tensile operation or whatever you do, you do it afterwards, not on the primary surgery. This is the uh, slide I wanted to show you, the primary surgeons, because suturing makes a lot of difference. These are basic surgical training. I, I was trained in general surgery first, then I come to the ophthalmology. So this equal bite is the course adjustment. This is the equal bite. This is the course adjustment. But placing the knot as a fine adjustment. If you put the knot here, there will be an overlapping of the margin. But if you put the knot here, there will be complete apposition of the margin. This is important, where you are placing the knot. And all knot should be placed in one side. One here and one there will make the scar very ugly. Second thing is that insufficient deep bite producing inversion and dead space. This is also important in suturing. Wherever you are doing a face suturing, wherever you are doing, just remember this. And unequal bites, here slightly less, here more. The unequal bite producing poor position of the wound edges. So basically lead is a suturing technique. The better you do, better you get a cosmesis. This is, uh, I, Raka has already shown the lead margin. These three cardinal sutures are the most important sutures in lead margin repair. One in the gray line, one in front and one behind. And you keep this slightly long and don't cut it here and put it in the these sutures so that it doesn't rub the cornea. This is important. Keep it slightly long and with this suture you tie it. This is the suture I did long back, but this is the primary repair. So I have not discarded any tissue. This is the on the table uh, before after completion of the suturing. This is the picture. So very meticulously you have to oppose all the margins. And this was the result at three to four months, the same child. And after that, you can do tosis repair or whatever you want. This is thus another simple suturing, but it looks very ugly. But once you suture, it is really nice. And when the basics are not followed, after sometimes three months or four months, we get this kind of patients. This is a lot of deformity. This is somebody has given a, almost a bursting suture over here. And this is, see how, where the eyelash is, has come. It, it should be here. But it is sutured like that. So thank you for your patient hearing. This is one of my painting. Raka has requested me to give it because these are all facial lines and aesthetics <laughs> shown here. Thank you, Raka. And any question? And the panelists are here. Please. Yeah, so excellent uh, presentation and uh, followed by uh, the uh, discussion. So we can take one uh, question from the audience, otherwise we'll go to the panelists. So any question? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. I want to know what investigation should we do before going to uh, repair or uh, dealing any uh, such case? Is it mandatory for radiography or tomography? Uh, what I want to say. Basically, it depends on the type of injury. In a road traffic accident, it is always better to have an X-ray of the face and the paranasal sinuses. And if you suspect any foreign body, it is a blast injury or something, go for an MRI also, CT MRI. But otherwise, you may not identify some foreign body lodged inside the orbit. So it is not possible clinically to identify at that stage. So it is safer to do an X-ray or a CT or an MRI imaging. And intact globe, you don't know. If you think it is intact, you can go for a USG after repair. Immediately after repair, you can. Because in a lacerated lid, you just, just cannot do an USG. Uh, I think panelists are here. They will answer. 
and I think this yeah, is sir, yeah, I think, the uh, yeah, minimum that was, thing you can do. That was answered quite nicely. So just have a question for the panelists. So ma'am, how long do you take to, uh, you know, uh, go for a ptosis repair after eyelid trauma? Like do you wait or like how much time would you take for a eyelid ptosis repair? At least for uh, six months we can wait yeah. because till that time there is a time of recovery. After that we will only think of repair if it is needed at all. Yeah, exactly. Depending upon the LPS function after six months we can go for a dosis repair. So that was an excellent session I guess. So in the benefit of time we like to conclude uh, this session on eyelid trauma. And following that… Uh, Dr. Shahid, yeah, sorry I have something to add. Yeah, please ma'am. Uh, Dr. Raka and Dr. Shourav has uh, given a very vivid picture how to do and all these things. But uh, just a few add-on points. One is uh, regarding the dog bites. There are many questions which uh, the juniors sometimes, with the seniors also are confused uh, regarding lead injury, when to repair the dog bite. Because once upon a time it was thought that dog bite should not be repaired, it should not be touched during the primary uh, when the patient is coming. But nowadays what they are saying is that you do the primary repair, that is the simple suturing, whatever is there, simple suturing, just to um, uh, you make the knot. And the secondary uh, thing you can do later. Secondary means any complicated injury repair that you can do later. Primarily you just give the, uh, one or two knots to keep the tissue, to keep the lead opposed. That is one. And next is that regarding the immunoglobulin, as you know, that add head, neck and uh, eye trauma is an, uh, it is a grade three injury. So immunoglobulin that should be given as early as possible surrounding the lead margin, it is given, the wound margin that is given locally, uh, along with the anti rabies vaccination. And next thing is that uh, if there is another point in going from dog bite to another issue. It, uh, just a day before, two days back, one of my junior was asking me, ma'am, the globe is totally collapsed and everything is coming out. And at the same time, the lead is totally avulsed and it is a very complicated injury. Which one I will do, ma'am, first? So this is another issue. What we will do? So I told it is better you do the repair of the globe first and then you, at the same sitting, you do the lead injury repair. This is one. Two. Number three point to add on is that superior, the superior lead, the upper lead repair is always you have to take it with a very, very uh, seriously. Because this is the lead which is covering the eye and any mistake or any uh, badly repaired uh, wound, that will give the patient a cornea, there will be abrasion, and the lifelong there will be and, uh, uh, opacity in the cornea, corneal ulceration, all these things. And uh, as uh, he already told, the tosis and all. So upper lid injury is more important, you have to take it really seriously. And during the lead uh, debridement, what Shura was telling, don't cut any tissue, but that is true. But sometimes, if you see that the, it is almost a necros tissue, within one or two days patient has come after that, then you may have to cut some amount of the tissue unless you are getting a good uh, uh, tissue. And another thing is that sometimes you may have to undermine the surrounding tissue to do a nice repair. That also you may have to do, at least. And regarding cleaning of the wound, cleaning means many a times we see the, the juniors, they are very busy to just do the repair. They are excited to do that. But this cleaning is very important. Cleaning means you do, how we do the chemical injury uh, uh, cleaning. At least 150 ml of normal saline with a saline wash, irrigation, continuous wash, and after that, you clean it with a 5% betadine because the same thing will take care of your cornea and the ocular surface and at, at the same time the lead also. Thank you. Thanks a lot, ma'am. So, uh, yeah.
sir uh, we have a, a like we are covering all the aspects of trauma and we you know we have to cover it on the lunch time our out out station faculties have to leave also so i'll request all the speakers discussions and panelists to you know slightly be on time so the next session is on uh, lacrimal uh, trauma how to manage the canalicular and lacrimal duct trauma and to talk upon that we have Do dr joyita das who is consultant orbit and oculoplasty at disha eye hospital to further discuss the topic uh, we have amongst us dr sanjita roy who is also a dr sabita katot sorry uh, who is a consultant orbit and oculoplasty at disha eye hospital ma'am please take a seat and uh, we have our uh, three panelists with us dr uh, devi kundu Associate Consultant Shankar Netralaya Rajar Hart, Dr. Uh, Prabrisha Banerjee, Associate Consultant uh, Shankar Netralaya uh, Mukundapur. Then we have uh, Dr. Madhushmita Behera, Consultant Rotary uh, Techno Netralaya, Kolkata. Yeah. And Dr. Joyita, you can start, please. Yeah. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Thank you, OSWV, for the kind inclusion. Uh, today, uh, after doing the uh, with a nice eyelid session, I will be talking on management of canalicular and lacrimal drug trauma. Trauma to the ocular adnexo is frequently results in laceration of the lacrimal system and canalicular involvement noted in around 36% of the all eyelid injury. And it's important that canalicular laceration is associated with 20% incidence of globe injury. The most common site of injury uh, involvement of uh, lacrimal system is canaliculi, followed by lacrimal, nasolacrimal duct, lacrimal sac, lacrimal puncta, and finally lacrimal gland because it resides in a uh, nice bony cavity of lacrimal fossa. In the canaliculi injury, the most common site is lower canaliculi. More than 50% cases are uh, seen in the lower canaliculi, followed by upper canaliculi and both canaliculi. The age young male are the commonest um, age group and always male outnumbers female here. The mechanism are penetrating injury or avulsion. In penetrating there is di direct trauma by laceration by a sub object or indirect trauma like high impact blunt trauma like fist injury or sports related injury. There are two nice study from one from India LBPI and another from uh, Wills Group, and they have uh, compared the data of epidemiology and the age group and the results of canaliculi repair after the trauma. And here uh, they matches all the parameter except there is one contrast that is the cause of the canaliculi injury. In Western scenario, the argument and the fist injury are the most common cause of canaliculi injury. Whereas in Indian uh, Indian patients, the blouse hook injury which is the exclusive to Indian uh, scenario is the most common cause of canaliculi injury in pediatric age group followed by metal rod injury, dog bite, etc. Now come to the management portion. The primary uh, aim is to repair early or primary repair. This is always better than repair it in the second uh, sitting. So we have to repair it in the uh, first stage. Next is whether uh, if it is a monocanalicular tear, that is either the upper canaliculi or the lower canaliculi affected, we will repair it uh, or not. In past, there was a conception, uh, um, misunderstanding that if it is only one canaliculi uh, is affected, then you can leave. However, the current practice is uh, we have to repair the both any of the canaliculi is affected. We have to repair it first, whether it is upper or lower, because there is now a concept of canalicular dominance, which is not equal, uh, similar in. Uh, it is different in different people, even different in one of the other eye also. So if one canaliculi is affected, other is norm, uh, normal, it may not be sufficient to drain the, especially the reflex tear uh, in around 50% of the cases. So whether it is upper or lower, please do repair. And the timing, 24 to 48 hours is the best time, but it can be delayed up to five days, even up to two weeks, you can also have a try. Um, First, you have to, uh, in the management, first to stabilize the medical condition, like we have to maintain the airway breathing circulation, followed by hemostasis. In hemostasis, the important point is we have to cauterize, min use minimum cautery to avoid iatrogenic trauma. Next is de localization of the distal curtain. So always do, do canaliculi repair under operating uh, microscope. And uh, look for calamari sign, which is the which is, uh, sine ring-like structure after um, hemostasis. Then check the patency of the track. Canaliculi stent then pass through both the end. Next is pericanalicular soft tissue suturing. 
you can do it in uh, by a single suture or double matrix suture which is my preferred technique and next the lead margin of suture in a conventional manner here is a short video clippings of uh, repair of lower lead canaliculi tear repair with a mini monoca stent this is a case of 10 years old boy with a right eye lower lead uh, injury by a face hook first wound exploration is done to identify the curtains yes this is the lower end uh, lower distal uh, end now the puncture is dilated with natal sip punctal dilator then the bowman's probe is passed through both the end once the heart stop it failed we are taking it out to take the measurement of the mini monoca stent now I'm passing the uh, stent through both the punctures from proximal to distal this is a self retaining uh, stent so no need to suture the punctal end i'm just simply passing the puncture through the distal end now we will suture the pericanaliculate soft tissue you may note that we are not suturing the canaliculi tissue itself the pericanaliculate tissue apposition is sufficient for the proper apposition we try to avoid the canaliculi suturing because in the long run it may cause fibrosis and um, the patency may be lost the anterior margin posterior margin sutures are kept long and the skins and muscle are closed in layers and the long sutures are tied with the skin sutures this is the final appearance the uh, stent is placed very nicely to the puncture next uh, the canaliculi stent the types are monocanaliculus stent when uh, only one puncture uh, only uh, one canaliculi is uh, have to be repaired we use mon monoca mini monoca and masterca stent commonly we get it here in the mini monoca stent which is easily available in here and next is bicanaliculus stent here we have crawford stent ritling spring and uh, pigdel and so on the advantage of monocanaliculus stents are these are very simple to insert as i show in, in a video and it can be done under general uh, only local anesthesia no need of general anesthesia it is it can be easily removed in opd however the disadvantage is it has a risk of spontaneous fall and it is quite expensive it costs around 3600 in india where a bicanaliculus stent can be um, can be taken by around 500 to 600 uh, rupees the bicanaliculus stent the advantage is it is familiar to most of the surgeon and it is available in almost uh, in all ot but it, the disadvantage is it can cause potential injury to the unaffected canaliculi and it need general anesthesia to um, do and uh, during uh, removal it also need an ipd admission because you cannot do it in the opd sitting this is a case of a 7 year old boy presented with a fall on the bicycle handle and you uh, know on examination we find there is upper lid full thickness avulsion with canaliculi tear and total disruption of the carunculus up to the lower lid canaliculi here uh, i did uh, upper lid and carunculus reposition with conjunctival tear repair with both uh, canaliculi repair with a mini uh, with two mini monoca stent and this is the post operative result and the patient is uh, still uh, down the four year of follow up he is still doing uh, patent uh, with no uh, uh, both the canaliculi are patent with no uh, complaint of tearing now come to the trauma induced nld obstruction this is uh, less frequent than canaliculi trauma it is seen in 7 to 15 percent of all facial trauma the common cause are especially uh, high impact blunt trauma like noe fracture nasal orbital ethmoidal fracture and uh, complex mid facial injury like lee fort and lee three and there are some causes of few uh, causes of atrogenic causes also like aggressive probing doing uh, during canary maxillary surgery rhinoplasty surgery we may uh, damage the canary uh, nld they usually present after 2 to 3 months of primary tra trauma with uh, symptoms of excessive tearing discharge and swelling Uh, associated other associated features of traumatic nld or telecanthus that is increase in the distance between the intercanthal distance is increased enophthalmos lower lid entropion ptosis and hypoglobus 
The diagnosis of traumatic NLDO starts with a proper history taking with the nature of injury. The fluorescent dye disappearance test, irrigation, and bowman probing is important. CT scan and PNS orbit is the first test investigation to do. CT DCG is a very well established modality of imaging because it nicely delineates NLD from the surrounding soft tissue and it also can delineate the mass in the lacrimal sac. This is a nice uh, CT, uh, CT DCG picture of one of my patients uh, having a lower lid, um, left eye NLD obstruction I repaired two weeks back. You can see very nicely this is the uh, normal side. This is the stain in the upper canaliculi and the lower canaliculi and the sac is filled up with the uh, stain with the dye. Where in the left side, that is the injured side, the sac is full with the dye. And in the next card, you can see the dye is uh, coming down it through the in bony NLD. However, in the left side, the dye is missing. And uh, in the next side, side sagittal, it is, it, sorry. In the sagittal section, uh, next, uh, just a minute. You can see in the left side, uh, the dye is missing. This is the uh, collection of the uh, dye in the sac, and this is the bony chip. You can see this is the bony chip, which is actually, this, yeah, this is the bony chip. Like yes, conclude, sir, yeah. I'm just finishing. Yeah. This is the bony chip, which is actually compress compressing the um, junction between the uh, sac and the NLD. So management portion, I'll just skip it out. Uh, first, I'll tell that in the uh, biocanalicular intubation during the primary repair is very important. We should wait at least for three months before any secondary uh, repair. And external DCR is the um, gold standard treatment here because endoscopic DCR is very, will be very difficult because of loss of body landmark. This is another case of um, NLD obstruction. Uh, first, repair with um, internal fixation done elsewhere. Okay, Jaita, I think just a minute. This is the last yeah. slide, sir. Yeah. This is the picture. I'm just doing last slide. And here you can, uh, you can see the plates are actually causing eroding the NLD block. So management in the first step, the external DCR with intubation done. In the first, second stage, after two months, it is lower lid ectropion repair with posterior auricular graft. So in summary, uh, the meticulous repair should be done by experienced person. And in canaliculi damage, always look for occult eye, uh, occult eye globe trauma. And in complex mid-facial trauma, please do a bicanalicular intubation during the primary repair because it will help the lacrimal surgeon during the secondary lacrimal reconstruction. Thank you. Yeah. In traumatic DCR, I will keep it minimum for three months. When in the normal DCR, like intubation, I keep you, uh, um, you can keep it. Oh, in the canaliculi, uh, minimum six weeks. Three months, you can up to you can keep up to three months, but uh, minimum six weeks you have to be there. But most of the time, you know, minimum canaliculi, especially in children, it tends to fall or sometimes the kid take it out <laughs> themselves. That is the problem. So, uh, uh, Joita has extensively covered everything. I have nothing much to say, but I'll just cover a few things. So, the common scenarios where we will suspect a canalicular or a, a nasolacrimal duct trauma is dog bites in children, scuffles in the young, falls in the elderly, and blouse hooks in infants in the Indian context. Like Saurabha said, we are MBBS doctors first, so you have to look at the patient as a whole. Uh, we cannot ignore the rest of the body. So you have to look at bodily injuries, see the vitals are okay, if there's any major injury or not. Then you look at the face. Does the face have any lacerations, any fractures? Then the eye. The eye you look at if there is any associated globe injury or not. And also uh, consider anti-tetanus and anti-rabies measures and give the patient a shot of IV antibiotic, NSAIDs, and topical drops. Canalicular injuries could be involving one or both the canaliculus, and uh, there is always usually a medial canthal aversion or a lid margin injury associated. Usually we do not see uh, trauma directly to the lacrimal sac because it's placed in a fossa and it's a little deep. But yes, traumatic NLDO is seen uh, in naso or vitoethmoidal fractures, and the reasons are uh, the scenarios are usually young males 
with a high velocity blunt injury or a history of a uh, road traffic accident or a patient undergoing uh, any tumor surgery like for maxillary CA. So we've already gone through all of this as to how to go about with the repair. Just one thing I would like to add, please take an informed consent and document the injuries and take photographs. These are very, very important even for medical legal considerations. And just presenting a case similar to what Joyita showed, it is, but in a three-year-old, it was a blouse hook injury. And under GA, we could see that the canaliculus is damaged, it's cut obliquely. And uh, it, uh, it was intubated with the probe. The medial edge is seen as a pale opening. And only two points in how to identify the medial edge, uh, a drop of phenylephrine could help because it decongests the tissues. And also remember that the opening is a little more superficial. I mean, we tend to dig, one would like to think that the medial edge is a little deeper, but actually it is a lot more superficial and not very difficult to see. And in this patient, I had sutured the flange to the lid margin because uh, this was a very small child and I was not very sure if the child would rub his eyes and the tube would come out. So in canalicular injuries, the lower ones are usually more common than the upper. Always remember that when there's a history of a hook injury or there's an involvement of the margin or a lower lid injury, these are the risk factors for canalicular involvement. And the post-operatively, you could land up with a stent loss or a stent infection, which I have seen in quite a few cases. And you could also get lid notching and ptosis. And you get very good outcomes with repair with mini Manoka stents. And it is irrespective of the time lag since injury to repair. We would like to think, oh, it's been two to three days. Now maybe we cannot do the repair. But, but uh, it, studies have shown that delayed repair also gives you very good outcomes. And mini Manoka works wonderfully. Always keep in mind, there's a uh, simultaneous risk of globe injury in 25% cases, especially where the upper canaliculus is involved. So the upper patient uh, uh, had a mid-facial trauma 30 years ago. He came to me with a very bad, uh, very large mucosal. I, un I did a DCT for him. Really? I finished. Okay, and uh, what we can do, a bicanalicular intubation but logistics are an issue. This is a post-traumatic pseudotelecanthus, where in the primary injury, there was an inadequate repair of the medial canthal tendon. I did a YV-plasty and application of the medial tendon, and we have a little better outcome out here. A special mention about medial canthal degloving injury, where you have a vertically oriented laceration traversing the medial canthus, which damages both the canaliculi and causes telecanthus and ptosis. These patients usually come to us late, and the reasons are RT and animal bites. And here the repair is done in a stage fashion. You do the lacrimal and the telecanthus first, and ptosis in the later stages. Thank you. Yeah, excellent presentations, uh, ma'am and Dr. Joita. I just uh, like to add one point that uh, <coughs> if the proximal cut end is quite long, so it, it would be difficult to locate the distal end because in those cases, the distal end might get retracted in, into the sac. So it, the likelihood of locating the distal end actually depends upon the length of the proximal end. So like if you notice both of your cases, the proximal end was quite small, like almost a, a millimeter. So that's why you could locate the distal end. But yeah, there is a prob probability that it might not be located. So the important thing is you have to counsel the patient that we, cannot, we might not be able to place the stent in some cases. So I think our panelists have a few questions to the speakers. So yeah, you can start, please. Hello. Uh, uh, most of the cases, uh, it's very difficult to find out the distal end of the canaliculus. What are the steps to be taken to, find, uh, to locate the distal end of the canaliculus? You have told only one irrigation yeah. and uh, irrigation you used. One, uh, and then uh, you should always uh, examine the patient under um, operating microscope with the proper lighting. And next is um, 
during that ma madam has already told i uh, put some decongestion drop with the distal cannulicula if the bleeding is controlled the whitish band is usually it's most of the cases you may find but if it is a pretty old injury then you can do one thing from the um, non unaffected um, cannuliculi you can inject some methylene blue or reti blue uh, uh, dye irrigation easily available you uh, can also um, see the look at that uh, is the um, uh, Reflects from that can distal be used fluorescent dye and methylene yeah, blue. Yeah, fluorescent dye is also good, but um, blue is actually very, it's, it's very much uh, you know prominently you and can we see. We can inject also air. Yeah, air, air also. also. Yeah, air is also and, uh, another thing. Uh, pig, with the help of pigtail pro. We actually, can pigtail pro I try to avoid because it uh, injures the uh, intubation um, like other unaffected um, cannuliculi most. Because it and is not uh, that one more question in uh, periphery, it's not possible to uh, get the mini monocastent. Yes. So what uh, other uh, other technique thing you can, can use that uh, vein flon light like twenty five number vein flon you can use that uh, IV check cannula IV cannula also can be used. Can be used in okay. Thank you. Okay. Actually, it's not difficult to get the mini monocastent at all. It's not that expensive. Also, Akriti gives it easily. I mean, you just have to know where to get it. Very frankly. Apparently, the expense was an issue, now even expense is not an issue. Can we use a proline suture? And See, that? there have been so many things advised, but like what I'm trying to say is this thing which is easily available, not very expensive, why not go for it? Just have to make sure that a few cents are available with you, that's all. Sab Sabita, may I ask you a question? Okay. Yeah, you're talking about, uh, uh, do you have an alternative to the mint monocus stent? A monocanalicular stent, which is an alternative to it. You said Not, the cost has gone down. Yeah, I mean, like, we don't use any alternatives right now. Okay. So, Oro there is something which is manufactured by Oro Lab. It's called Oro the Oro stent, stent which is a copy of the Mini Monaca. I don't okay. know if it is licensed. Okay. But yes, it is. Uh, yeah, this is more Oro stent, uh, which I uh, yeah. use. Oro stent. Just to, uh, like, uh, ma'am and Dr. Joita Das, both of them has uh, explained everything in details. Just for the sake of completion, there was a point about the dog bite injury. So in those cases, we inquire about the immunization status of the dog also, if it is a paid dog. And if the dog is completely immunized, then we need not go for the anti-rabies or the immunoglobulins. But however, if there is any doubt about the immunization status, then always we should go for the anti-rabies vaccine. And uh, one more thing regarding the traumatic NLDO, these cases are better to be taken under general anesthesia because we never know what kind of fractures we will encounter when we go for those surgeries. So it is always helpful that we take these cases under general anesthesia. And uh, I would just like to ask, do you think that uh, uh, CTDCG is essential in these cases? Yeah, well, uh, CT DCG is essential, but nowadays in Kolkata, CT DCG center is uh, less. So we can only order CT scan, NCCT of orbit, special mention to PNS and face also. And we should include the cuts, that is sagittal, axial and coronal cuts also, uh, to see the, the other associated injuries. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Eye trauma. And to moderate the session, I'll hand over the mic to uh, Dr. Sabita. So, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Love uh, Coach Kave. He's director, executive director, Netralyam. And discussing the topic will be Dr. Chandni Chakraborty, director, Pan Vision Eye Clinic. The panelists on the session are Anuradha Chandra and Dr. Ketki. Dr. Ketki is with Dishai Hospitals. She's a pediatric ophthalmologist, and Anuradha is director of Global Eye Hospitals. I request them please come on the stage, Dr. Love. Thank you so much. And uh, the topic I would be covering is uh, pediatric anterior segment trauma. And uh, since the time is limited, I would straight away uh, go to various videos that will show how children present with anterior segment trauma. So let's start. This was a 15-year-old child, came few years back. Actually, he came to uh, uh, Dr. Saurav Sinha. And what he noticed was a slight vitreous hemorrhage. Beyond that, uh, he could not notice anything. 
and this structure. So we decided to explore it and while exploring what we saw is something looks like a foreign body in the subconjunctival space and uh, mobile and here what you can see the, since the child had presented early you have the entry wound for the subconjunct and it has migrated in the subconjunctival space almost 4 to 5 millimeter away. So we started dissecting right at the foreign body and what we saw the conjunctiva has been cut then the tenons has been separated and you get a pellet injury there was some firing going on while the child was uh, going that side and he had a pellet inside the his subconjunctival space so this is one of the presentations what we get this this case was long back uh, almost 10 years back and post diwali was seen by Dr. Partho Biswas. Generally, he doesn't leave anything, but the case was so bad that he dumped it on me. And when I saw, I, I cursed myself, why did this case come to me? But gathering all the courage, we decided to do uh, clean the injury and all the suit in the uh, uh, skin, lid margins, the conjunctival sac was removed, copious irrigating fluid was given, and we didn't know what it would hold inside when we started this, but the structures of the eye was more or less clear. Little bit of limbal ischemia was there, corneal haze was there, but once you clean all the suit, and as you can see, the, all the eyelashes are burned. Took about 15-20 minutes uh, to clean the whole conjunctival sac, and then the child was later on put on antibiotic steroid combination. And to my surprise, when I started this case, I didn't even imagine that the result would be so good. The child later on had 6-9 vision. Next comes very common. In school, children throwing pencil at each other and uh, this was again this case. And good thing about these cases, you remember all the history. This case also came to Dr. Saurabh Sena. And, uh, once I ex started exploring, the first thing uh, I got uh, caught hold of was vitreous. So now you know that it is a full thickness uh, scleral injury. So uh, dissection of the conjunctiva was, was done at a distance, not exactly over the injured part. And what once you expose it, what you see here is a full thickness uh, scleral injury. So it is always important to explore these cases. When in, when in doubt, best is to go to the OT and explore these cases because the results are very encouraging once you repair these cases. Otherwise, this child would have either ended up with an endophthalmitis or a retinal detachment. So two 10, um, 6 o vicryl sutures were put and then the conjunctiva was closed. Another important, I think, uh, Dr. Dipanjan will also cover, so I'm just uh, putting uh, uh, one case here, and uh, this was a case uh, in which the lens was subluxated and uh, due to the blunt injury, and uh, as usual, a traumatic cataract, iris, iridodialysis, and this is a very common presentation, zonular dialysis combined with iridodialysis, so we have case to case, we have to decide whether we want to repair the iris as well. So in here, once a cortical aspiration was done and uh, it's always better to stabilize the bag at whatever stage you feel deem fit. Uh, there are various arguments whether it should be done before cortical aspiration, whether it should be done through the main port or side port. It, is, it depends on the surgeon's confidence level. Then once the, uh, after CTR implantation, IOL is implanted in the bag. And many of these cases will have a component of Berlin edema and then later on uh, foveal atrophy. So that also needs to be looked into and before operating the guarded visual prognosis has to be explained to the patient parents. Posterior capsulorexis is done using a cutter. And this is the final outcome of the case. So, same thing, similar situation with a larger iridodialysis if you get, then you have to repair the iris as well. So here what you see is a larger iridodialysis in which the Hoffman pocket is made with a 
टेन ओ प्रोलीन सूचर एंड यूजिंग द रेल रोड टेक्निक द आईरेस इज ब्रॉड टूवर्ड्स द लिम्बस एंड सूचर्ड सो एट द एंड ऑफ इट यू विल गेट अ फेयरली राउंड प्यूपिल now another case in which which has a traumatic cataract with a ruptured anterior capsule and uh, what we have to aim most of these cases if possible the lens has to be placed in the bag so whenever we are getting traumatic cases first aim should be to see how you could place the lens in the bag and what you see here after through the existing opening itself we did the cortical aspiration and now you after the cortical aspiration you have a opening in the anterior capsule which is small and we know that a good capsular excess is not possible in these cases so bag was inflated the main port made and using a vana scissor the fibrous edge of the anterior capsular opening is uh, open a partial capsular excess done other edge also cut with the vana scissor same thing done on the other side and what you get at the end of uh, it is a decently sized capsular excess which is uh, round and central and then the lens is placed in the bag so this is another presentation this was a case of a intrastromal bamboo stick in a child and uh, what we fear in these is th these need to be intervened early because they may uh, end up with a fungal keratitis so initially with uh, the blade initial opening was made in the cornea but what you realize here is that foreign body is very deep and we have to be very careful not to cut through and through because again if you are cutting through and through you are increasing the chances of infection so we went again deeper in the uh, stroma and then finally the foreign body could be removed and since it was a not a full thickness cut uh, i didn't suture i le left it like that but again a good betadine wash is required in these cases so that post op infection is not there and i think this is probably the last case and i'm well in time so this was uh, again a wooden particle injury and when the child presented there was a subconjunctival swelling so once the conjunctiva was dissected still you see a scleral thickening so a partial thickness scleral incision was given and what you see is pus oozing out of it but still the foreign body is not visible so we kept exploring this and again care has to be there that full thickness um, this thing doesn't happen and what you saw just now was the corneal uh, the intrascleral foreign body removed and then again wash with uh, beta dean and then subconjunctiva and these cases all do very well what i have not covered is what the most common thing which is the corneal wound repair and that comes in various presentations and that is the most common surgery what we do in pediatric anterior segment trauma thank you so much no sir we didn't do because it was a wooden particle no the history was of a wooden particle so imaging will not pick that up very good morning uh, thanks to oswb and thanks to oswb and dr rajesh for having me here uh, after those enchanting videos let's have a comprehensive look on pediatric ocular trauma i have no financial interest in this presentation so my uh, sorry uh, so my presentation i have uh, arranged in a little weird manner uh, that is uh, i have first kept the prevention part uh, though uh, we uh, actually start from the uh, uh, history part but here we i have kept the uh, prevention part because prevention is always better than uh, your treatment so uh, un supervised play should be avoided we have to create consciousness during the school screening and also in uh, pediatric uh, parents uh, group discussions about uh, uh, the dangers of unsupervised play 
Now the prevention part also includes uh, the, uh, to avoid the dangerous play objects uh, like uh, sharp objects, balls, uh, small cricket balls, uh, the pieces of stone, etc. So these are all the real objects I got in my patients so which caused injury to the uh, eyes. Now the evaluation part, meticulous history is very important uh, to anticipate what type of injury may occur in the eye and the adnexal structure. Then visual assessment which may be a challenge in case of pediatric patients and uh, thorough examination uh, uh, should be done if required under GA because uh, the pediatric exam eye examination is also a challenge especially in a traumatized child. And uh, we have to also anticipate the long-term impacts like angle decision glaucoma and all. Uh, and the role of imaging uh, is very important uh, here. And uh, do not shy away from imaging from a trivial uh, injury also. Now these are some cases of open, uh, globe, uh, open and closed globe injuries you can see. Uh, and uh, this, uh, they have to be very uh, meticulously examined to an anticipate and also to de detect all the uh, injuries have occurred to the ocular structures. Now these are the some posterior segment trauma which have happened after uh, injuries like uh, vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachment, retinal macular hole and choroidal tear. Now the pre predicting the outcome here, there is something different from the adult uh, because uh, we have the basic uh, OTS or the uh, ocular trauma score but uh, for pediatric there is a special system called uh, pediatric ocular trauma score and the toddler ocular trauma score. So this is the, um, uh, I am not going into details, this is the uh, OTS or the uh, ocular trauma score uh, which was uh, for gen in general for all patients. Now the special pediatric uh, ocular trauma score, it includes the zones of uh, injury like uh, the, according to the distance from the limbus and uh, is given uh, some uh, scores and higher the point, better is the prognosis. So uh, here also the assessment of visual acuity is uh, important. So there is a, a special trauma score that is toddlers ocular trauma score which is uh, used for infants and toddlers where visual acuity is not taken into account and this is uh, practically uh, easier to uh, assess in uh, case of small children. And here the extent of injury is taken uh, given some points and here higher the points, uh, worse is the prognosis. Now the treatment proper here you can see some, uh, some cases uh, of uh, traumatic uh, cataracts treated with uh, uh, intraocular lens implantation with seat belt technology and al also other uh, uh, normal uh, intraocular lens implantations and inflammation is always higher in case of traumatic cases. Now here is an interesting case of traumatic bounds. Uh, you can see here it was self-limiting after giving anti-inflammatory it uh, resolved totally. And this is a uh, incarceration of the medial rectus due to orbital fracture after treatment, uh, after uh, surgery. It was uh, stable uh, till two years of follow-up. Now here are my references. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. So if you look through the Indian studies, you would find in pediatric cases, 20% of the cases are uh, injury related. And among them, merely is predominant because they are sports injury. If you see the projectile injury is the most common injury that you would find and in earlier in 2002 bow arrow was considered to be the most common injury but now it has decreased in numbers. Uh, long term follow up has to be important particularly in pediatric cases because they are going to live for a long time. So amblyopia, glaucoma and uh, retinal detachment, angle recession, glaucomas these need to be considered. Uh, and again, uh, TON is a traumatic optic neuropathy, is something which is missed because these patients come with RTA. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ketki, would you say anything? Uh, yeah, I would like to add three points. Uh, first, pertaining to the corneal tear, which we very often corneal raceration we encounter. In that, I would like to say that the peripheral part of the cornea can you uh, any kind of suture longer suture can be placed but when it is involving the visual axis we have to keep it shorter and in the center portion can be left uh, you know one or two millimeters can be left free of sutures so that future they don't have chances of amblyopia related to higher astigmatism so central short and peripheral longer sutures 
when the limbal tear is there, I mean the corneoscleral tear is there, in post-operative thorough uh, peripheral examination to see any vitreous incarceration, peripheral retinal detachment should be seen. Then when uh, in, in terms of uh, traumatic cataracts, if there is a fibrovascular sinicia, you have to release the sinicia, let the, uh, I mean, uh, cauterize all the blood, but IOL <coughs> can be not put if it is bleeding inside the eye, so that later on the chances of those pigment deposits on the IOL and that leading to visual loss in a child is prevented. And the third point is, is even chemical injuries are very common and uh, lime packets, tuna packets are very commonly available and children are exposed to lime and tuna. So that should be, uh, you know, thorough, if that is the case and first time we see it, then thorough washing of the eye, removal of the ch clunks, chunks of the lime should be done. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ketki. Thank you, everyone, for a great session. Uh, we have a change of plans. Uh, we'll first go to the sponsored talk by Dr. Shurojit Chakraborty. It's in search of an ideal adjunct in medical management of glaucoma. Then we'll go ahead with the session later on. Though not with a great thrust, he had, he had a pediatric ocular trauma with caterpillar hair that should be included uh, in this uh, chapter. Uh, I uh, was uh, for long duration in district and subdivisions and those uh, cause direct corneal conjunctival injuries and even uh, uveitis later on. So we had to remove those caterpillar hairs under genesthesia and if not totally removed, the uh, uh, child suffered a lot. Yes, yes. And maybe repeat, uh, uh, the child may need repeat sittings also because exactly. after one week you might see some more CP hairs coming out. Okay, okay. And uh, you have to, suspicion is the big thing. Because if you don't suspect it, you won't see it, CP hair especially. Right. Thank you. And I have seen uh, they are very difficult to remove the sulfur particles if there is any firecracker injury. And that is a great problem. And some f particles enter into the stroma. Superficial particles we can remove. But those particles uh, is not possible to remove. How would you manage, madam? Uh, I think some cornea person can answer that. Uh, we have a session on cornea and all. Can we do this question then? Okay, okay. Huh? We'll do this. We'll come to this question later on. Dr. Shurajit, please. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, OSWD, for including me in this session. And uh, as all of you know that this is a sponsored session. So there is some financial disclosures, but as a speaker, as a clinician, I will try to do justice as much as possible and not restrict myself to these uh, specific slides. So uh, when we talk about glaucoma, this is a little bit off track. It is not uh, regarding trauma. So just talk about something which is relevant in our day-to-day -day legal practice. When you talk about glaucoma, we think of a medication, a primary medication, a monotherapy to start. And it is very clear that uh, we start with prostaglandins these, these days. The days of Timulal uh, are gone. We, uh, if there is no contraindication, we straight away start with prostaglandins. And often we need to t add some medication to that. So if you look at the glaucoma burden is in, the, in India, it's huge. And you know the treatment goals of glaucoma, it is primarily to protect the visual field of a patient. That is why we control IOP and IOP fluctuations. And we need to uh, maintain patient's quality of life also with less side effects, uh, so le preservative free or less preservative toxicity is often preferred. And also that has to be cost effective. These are the commonly used medications for Intraocular pressure reduction in eyes. And when we uh, see the algorithm of glaucoma treatment, often we see there is a need to add a second medication or a third medication to the initial treatment when the uh, target pressure is not reached or even if there is something called progression in the visual field structurally or functionally 
uh, if there is progression, we need to add a second medication or third medication as per requirement. So which should be the ideal adjunct? Is there any one answer to this? Is it timolol, is it dozolamide, is it brizolamide, brimorin, pilocarpine, or newer rokinase inhibitors? See, in our following slides, we'll see that often, if there is no contraindication, the timolol is the first thing that is easily added to the medication with prostaglandin as, as the combinations are available. Or it can be, uh, it is one medicine which is usually combined with uh, all other this, uh, medications. So, Timolol becomes a natural choice. What next? Is it dimonidine? So this gives additional IOP uh, reductions ranging from 15 uh, to 20%. But uh, there are incidences of ocular allergy and absolute contraindication to dimonidine is used in children uh, as it causes fatal respiratory uh, arrest. And also in uh, elderly people also you will uh, see many patients are complaining of somnolence, dizziness, sleepiness and hypotension. So next comes carbonic energy inhibitors. They are generally safe, well tolerated with IOP lowering uh, efficacy of 15 to 20 percent. They are uh, the next choice if bimodin is not working or bimodin has some problem. So this is the alternate choice to uh, which to choice between choose between bimodin and carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So let us uh, have a look at the IOP lowering effect, drosolamide versus brinzolamide when added to timolol. Please mark this when added to timolol. They have already added timolol and then they are studying this. So drosolamide versus brinzolamide, they uh, both uh, show some good uh, IOP lowering potential. But uh, drosolamide uh, timolol fixed uh, combination provides significantly better. IOP lowering as per this study, but you will see other study in the similar set of slides where the IOP lowering potential is uh, comparable or equal in both the groups. So when it's compared to brimodrin alone, definitely the IOP reduction is better. Dorsolamide versus brinzolamide, again, will come to a different study in this presentation. We can see that dorsolamide gives a fairly uh, good additional IOP reduction as an adjunct. When compared to uh, ocular blood flow, why do we need to look at the ocular blood flow? Because all we think when, when we think that uh, the glaucoma is well controlled, is it actually well controlled? Because it is still, uh, the glaucoma still progresses in spite the IOP is apparently within uh, uh, target limits. So, if you look at it, uh, both the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, they both have shown to improve ocular blood flow and thus delay progression. But if we com uh, compare between these two particular molecules, dorsolamide shows a little better ocular blood flow compared to brinzolamide. And this study, just I was, what I was telling, uh, dorsolamide and brizolamide have similar uh, IOP lowering efficacies, but uh, ocular uh, blood flow related things uh, look a little bit better with the dorsolamide. And uh, so some uh, uh, studies also support that dorsolamide can preserve the visual field in a better way. So when you compare this molecule with the other medicines, it shows a very favorable result as you can see here. Comparison of safety and tolerability, obviously there are studies to prove and disprove. There are studies which says brimolol, I, I mean, uh, which says uh, brinzolamide is better, uh, which, and some will say that dorsolamide is better. But, uh, for this particular thing, I would suggest as a clinician, honest clinician, just open the Googles, you will get the answer, dorsolamide versus brinzolamide, uh, tolerability things. And side effects of brimodin, of, of, of course, in children, you should be very cautious about the uh, brimodin in children. And tolerability, I leave it up to you, because not all the studies are done in the similar population. 
and I leave the decision on to you, your, how your patients uh, complain or uh, gives you the feedback which one is better tolerated. And something uh, regarding need for the preservative free options in glaucoma management, obviously the medicines which are uh, with less I mean, with their, uh, which are uh, with a better uh, tolerated uh, uh, preservatives are more welcome, but cost remains a factor in here. So, what is the take-home point? Additional IOP lo uh, lowering therapy should be considered when a patient's IOP is not a target or when progression is detected on structural or functional testing. The decision to add a medication in to the treatment regimen of a patient with glaucoma or ocular hypertension should be based on the patient's disease staging, risk of evidence of progression and ability to be compliant with adjunctive therapy. Fixed combinations reduce the number of installations, reduce drop washout and pro provide excellent IOP lowering. Uh, improved compliance can uh, can be cost effective. In patients who progress despite IOP con uh, control, it is time to look at comorbidities and other vascular factors that treat accordingly and uh, with a visuoactive drug like drothalamide or brenzolamide. The use of multiple drops with uh, preservatives can rest in, result in ocular surface disease, but this can be managed with the use of preservative-free versions of the drugs. So do we get a uh, clear uh, answer or clear winner about the question what we asked and uh, in search of an ideal adjunct? There is no one ideal adjunct. It all depends on the patient's systemic profile, on the uh, local effects, and on your own clinical decision whether that is going to work for your, that particular patient. So treatment has to be individual. That is the answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shurujit. I think we all are looking for ideal answers. So we go on to the uh, posterior segment trauma session. Uh, the speaker is Dr. Aniruddha Maiti. He is Director of Global Eye Hospitals. Dr. Rupak Roy, we are consultant in Shankar Netralia. And the panelists are Dr. Saurav Sinha, who is at Netralia, Dr. Dev Malya Das, uh, who's at S. Shankar Netralia and Dr. Sangeeta Roy, uh, retina specialist and director of Global Eye Hospital. Please come on to the stage, the panelists and the speaker. Dr. Rupak Roy. A very good morning to all. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Rajesh and Dr. Rupak for giving me this opportunity. Well, I will be uh, showing few uh, cases, traumatic cases, uh, to start with a simple case of sub-ILM bleeding. Uh, this is a condition where it's easy to manage but at times it is very difficult to diagnose as this was a traumatic, uh, had a fist injury and this patient was treated with uh, laser hyalurotomy, thinking that it was a hyalide, sub hyalide hemorrhage but obviously uh, it was not a sub hyalide hemorrhage so it didn't respond and you can see it is a very well defined margins quite typical of sub ILM bleeding this patient had undergone three times laser hyalurotomy So we are peeling the ILM to release the blood beneath the ILM. Once we have removed the ILM, it's pretty easy job to flush out the blood. So we have cleared the posterior pole and this has a very rewarding result the next day itself from finger counting 2 feet to 6, 9. The second case, uh, this is a traumatic case, uh, thanks to Shangita for sharing this case. I have kept this case uh, because sometimes the intraocular foreign body is very difficult to locate. So this was one of the keys, it was operated outside but they could not find the foreign body. You can see the retinal detachment has already, uh, there is a lot of PVR changes, 
this side of the retina is quite stiff so relaxing retinectomy needs to be done now you can see the intraocular foreign body is actually beneath the retina Further retinectomy needs to be done to take out the foreign body. Now that's that's the foreign body underneath the retina. and then taken out to the anterior segment root, limbal root. Once the foreign body is taken out, the retina is settled, putting PHCL and a proper laser done. Now this is a very recent case I have operated yesterday. Uh, this was a traumatic case which was operated outside but it failed. Uh, this was a traumatic retinal detachment. You can see the retina is almost like a closed funnel RD. We had to do a lensectomy. Now the retina looks bad because the, uh, the edges were also rolled out, uh, the vitrectomy was not complete, we completed the vitrectomy and the edges were trimmed where it was rolled out and then putting PFCL to flatten the retina, luckily the posterior pole was quite good. <coughs> I cauterized the edges because at places we had to trim it off because it was quite stiff and rolled out then treat it as a 360 degree RR case settled well and did a direct PSL silicon oil exchange. This is the end of the surgery. Now coming to the last case, this patient had a very bad trauma. The moving fan actually fell down on his head and injured the eye. So when he had come, uh, first of, uh, he was actually admitted in a general hospital where the, the head injury was treated. And when he came to us, the eye was total hypotonus and we explored that there was a large tear which extended from the 6 o'clock position well repairing we saw that it is extending uh, beneath the insertion of the muscle luckily Dr. Uh, Anuradha was also with us so it was easy to disinsert the muscle and repair the globe rupture beneath the muscle insertion it was quite a uh, long 
globe rupture open globe rupture from 6 to 9 So as this was a uh, very hypotonous eye and an open globe, we could not do properly the uh, ultrasonography. But the intention was to see, we will put trocar cannula and see what is there inside. If it, if it was a uh, minor, uh, it's not a very significant vitreous hemorrhage or there was no RD, then it would have planned as a two-stage operation. So after removing uh, the blood in the anterior chamber we saw it's a total retinal detachment with supracoronal hemorrhage on the other side of the rupture and it was impossible to uh, deal the situation without doing a lens uh, removing the lens there was a little bit of traumatic cataract as well These cases can be done in a two-stage, but as already the patient had uh, was admitted in a general hospital for 10 days and there was a total detachment, so I uh, decided to do in a single-stage operation. And as you can see, the, there was a uh, dense vitreous hemorrhage and underlying total retinal detachment. Other side, there was a choroidal tear as well and supracoroidal hemorrhage. So gradually, uh, with a lot of patients, we removed the blood. The first intention was to remove the blood from the posterior pole. And once we have removed, we will put some PF cell to stabilize the posterior pole and do the rest of the vitrectomy. PFCL I'll just forward a little bit and did a good laser In this case also we had to put oil actually we did a direct exchange PFCL oil exchange That's the last bubble of the oil. So this was the post-op picture from the perception of light to 624 vision. So with advances in the PPV technique and wide angle viewing system, many eyes that would have otherwise been lost can now be saved with a meaningful vision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anirudho, for the great presentation. Dr. Rupa Kraj, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Maiti, for this wonderful videos. I thank uh, OSWB uh, Rajesh Dhar and Dr. RKB for this opportunity. I'll be uh, speaking about, uh, basically discussing about the basic approach uh, to management of posterior segment trauma. So mainly I'll be discussing about the diagnosis part, imaging, uh, timing of intervention and surgical approach I'll really not go into because Dr. Maiti has already highlighted. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, whenever you see a patient of trauma, especially with open globe injury, it is very important to ask specific questions to rule out whether there is, could be any intraocular foreign body. A thorough clinical examination is of course required, but do not uh, do applanation tonometry in a case of uh, open globe. Uh, there should be a high index of suspicion for occult globe rupture. Sometimes you see a patient with 360 degree conjunctival chemosis with low IP ads, the last case. So in these cases, uh, the clinician should have a high suspicion of uh, a globe rupture which is not really picked up in ultrasonography. If you are dealing with a blunt trauma, do a OCT or a fundus photo if the view is clear for documentation and treatment. USG is an invaluable tool uh, uh, to rule out hemorrhage, retinal detachment and coral detachment. There is always confusion whether to do or not to do ultrasonography in open globe injuries. Uh, so we should uh, not do ultrasonography in open globe injuries. 
So if there is an open globe injury, you want to rule out whether there is an intraocular foreign body, we should do CT scan with very thin cuts. And we should avoid MRI because sometimes, you know, the patient can have metallic foreign bodies. Uh, by doing MRI, we can aggravate the things. So basically, if you have an open globe injury, <coughs> you, you really don't know what is inside. Either there is a retinal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage. So at that point of time, the ophthalmologist should basically uh, get a uh, secure uh, uh, suturing to get the wound integrity, then can plan ultrasonography the next day. So the commonest uh, situations that we face is a blunt trauma. We can see this is a whitening and the OCT is very characteristic. Uh, this is ischemia, so there is thickening. So basically, uh, these patients should be treated with topical steroids and we should always look out for the IOP hike. These patients often have high intraocular pressures. Subretinal hemorrhage is also very common. Um, so if it is a submacular, we should treat early with uh, displacement with C3F8 gas. So this is one of our patients which we treated with gas and you can see the macula is better. But see the choroidal rupture was not seen with the hemorrhage. So do not promise too much in a trauma patient. You don't know what surprise the patient throws up. So uh, subretinal hemorrhage you treat early. And finally we have uh, traumatic macular hole cases. So Traumatic macular hole cases have a high chance of resolution on their own. So at least wait for a month before going for surgery. So coming to open globe injuries, so the primary goal is to have an early wound closure with restoration of anatomic integrity. See, there is a lot of confusion regarding if the patient has an open globe and a retinal attachment, open globe with a vitreous hemorrhage, what has to be done. But from, from, <coughs> from a VR surgeon's point of view, you should not rush into doing the surgery of the posterior segment. There are situations when you can tackle both the things together, but Trust me, most of the times it is not possible to do both of them together. So do not sweat over it, just get the wound closure done and always try to do this surgery under general anesthesia. Uh, it has been my experience from my days in RIO where I have done a lot of corneal tear repairs and now in SN where I have been doing a lot of corneal tear repairs still. Trauma is one of the most difficult surgeries that a surgeon can do. This we all need to understand. So obviously a fellow, a student or a resident can start a trauma surgery, but really it is injustice to the patient if the full surgery is done by a resident because trauma can throw up so many surprises. There are so many challenges with the visibility, lot of bleeding, the tissues are edematous. So it is best handled by a a competent surgeon, not a good case for uh, the fellows or the PGs to do. So uh, when should we intervene? So vitreous hemorrhage, if the retina is attached, we can wait for two weeks. I don't think we should wait more than because we have to give patient vision also. Retinal detachment, again, we can wait for seven days because there is a thought that with seven days there is evolution of PVD and the surgery becomes easy. Intraocular foreign body, we should treat early and endophthalmitis, we should treat early. But the only thing we have to remember, surgery, surgery can be done only, only when we can see. So if you cannot see, you cannot operate. So media clarity is very important. Media here I mean is cornea. So uh, in trauma, bilateral same sitting surgery is advocated. There, are, there have been patients who have bilateral tear, bilateral intraocular foreign body. So no harm, no medical legal issue in treating those patients bilaterally in the same sitting. Always plan a combined surgery. I mean combined with the keratoprosthesis, if, if there is an issue with the media clarity, do not struggle with the edematous, opaque cornea, sutured cornea. So we should always uh, have a cornea surgeon stand by. So these are the caveats which I might think of in our open globe injury with the posterior segment involvement. So uh, always be prepared for the extreme. This is one of our cases which was treated long back. This is a uh, th this is a case of a 12 hour old baby. I repeat, the baby was 12 hour old. So the baby had a forceps injury with a corneal tear and a retinal detachment and the cornea is opaque, opaque. So we did a combined keratoplasty and a retinal detachment surgery. So in trauma you always can be from very simple to very complex. Uh, thank you very much. I invite comments from the panel. Five minutes. Can you go to the first slide, please? Oh, yeah. The first slide. Uh, diagnostics, that one. So, um, what, what Rupak has said is absolutely textbook and uh, what we should follow. But like, I, like he kept saying, there are caveats. And I keep saying people in the periphery, people who don't have access to CT scan, MRIs. 
small center, single man practice, walk-in patient, your first lady. So there, uh, I think, for treating your patient and for medical purpose, at least get an X-ray done. If your patient can't afford it, if your patient can't do a CT scan, get an X-ray done. It may not help much in the treatment, but for as a medical legal case, as you didn't know an ultrasound because you know it's an open globe. But for the patient and their relatives, it's a very difficult thing to understand that no investigation was done. So an X-ray is not a bad idea in some cases. Second, again, the other extreme is if you have very small foreign body, very anteriorly behind the iris, a lead pencil, a small injury over there, a small foreign body, wooden particle, something like a UBM should be kept in mind also as a diagnostic criteria in some very rare cases. So keep a UBM in mind for a very small anterior segment foreign body, which should not be picked up on an ultrasound, closed robe, uh, not open wound, small penetrating injury, still AT is okay, you, you still wondering why what's happening, small endothelium kind of a picture, UBM and an X-ray for all patients. Thank you. Uh, so one more point to add for your blunt trauma thing is for residents it is important that whenever a blunt trauma patient is coming, periphery should be screened. It might not be possible to indent the patient on the same day because of the pain and all, but you should call back the patient again after 10-15 days to look for a dialysis or a, I think GRT nobody will miss. The main, main thing which is missed is a dialysis, so for that indentation has to be done very nicely. And uh, so my point is that uh, simultaneously doing a retinal surgery when there is supracarotal hemorrhage is a little risky, though, though at certain point of time it is necessary. But uh, the only problem that can happen is that even if everything goes on is that the oil is underfilled and there's a potential of recurrent retinal it has been those eyes. But that might be the only time we could get access to the eye. No, I, a, I think uh, you are absolutely correct. We generally plan it in a two-stage operation. But considering this case which I showed, this is already, we have lost 10 days and uh, we saw what was there inside. So maybe waiting for another 10 days would have been, uh, the, surgery, the prognosis would have been bad. And one small comment about Sir's first case uh, in which there was a sub ilum hemorrhage. I think uh, somebody tried a YAG uh, hyalurotomy also, misdiagnosis it as a sub hemorrhage. So good OCT helps. Price. Three times the laser was done yeah. thinking it was a sub hemorrhage. So, that's… So diagnosis good, should be done. Good OCT is… Uh, if we see it properly, then we can uh, make out a sub ilum hemorrhage. Thank you. Any other points anybody wants to add? Yeah. So, just one point I want to emphasize is that trauma surgery should ideally be done under general anesthesia. Uh, so, <clears throat> sometimes general anesthesia arranging could be a little challenging. But in local anesthesia, sometimes the outcome can be <coughs> because of the pressure when you give the block, you don't know what happens after the block. So always we should make an effort to do the traumas under general anesthesia. I think uh, the last case, we did it in general anesthesia, but we didn't expect so many things to happen. That's right. So traumas are full of surprises. You never know if the surgery might go on for long hours. I mean, documentation is also important. That's why very important. Well, thank you. Thank you everyone for the great thank session. You. And we move on to management of traumatic cataract and glaucoma. The speaker is Dr. Dipanjan Pal, Senior Glaucoma Consultant at Dishai Hospitals. Dr. Alokesh Ganguly will be discussing. He is uh, attached to Priyamvada Birla Hospital. The panelists are Dr. Sagar Bhargava, he is uh, with the Netralayam Hospital and Dr. Surajit Chakraborty, who is also with Priyamvada Birla Arvind Eye Hospitals. Once again, I would request all the speakers, please uh, stick to time, and then we can finish on time and have a lunch on time. So, very good morning to all. It is pleasure to be in here with uh, West WB session and thanks Rajesh for the in invitation. So it's a very large topic. I will just give a primary outline. Um, so whether it is an open globe injury or a closed, a concussional or a penetrating injury, around 27 to 65 percent of ocular trauma lead to cataract and often they have damage to the other ocular structures. And we should remember that it is disproportionately affect young people. 
to go for a surgical planning it is important to have a good history starting from the age of the patient as we know that the pediatric age group there is a risk of amblyopia the mechanism of injury whether we have to look for an intraocular foreign body the timeline is important as if there is a rapid onset of cataract probably the anterior capsule is breached and patient's ocular history particularly to prognosticate the case and also if he has prior ocular surgeries in the same eye and also the systemic comorbidities are important as if the patient is of uh, uncontrolled diabetes or on immunosuppression there is chance of endophthalmitis going through the examination accepting visual acuity retinal acutimetry is very important to give the visual potential look for RAPD whether there is an optic nerve injury and if the IOP is asymmetrically low it points towards a globe rupture or a cyclodiasis cleft if it is in high there is there can be lenticular subluxation lens particle high femur angle recession in the late case in cornea can be a clean cut self seed injury to a laceration and there is a difficulty in IL power cal calculation entry chamber there can be high femur lens material inflammatory debris vitreous prolapse and in iris there can be translation defects hole of a particular foreign body pass through or a sphincter tear and do not miss an opportunity to do a gonioscopy at the very first time um, if there is a blunt trauma and if the when the eye quietens down in six to eight weeks time to look for sometimes blood angularization <coughs> trabecular disruption or even a foreign particle so going for the surgical planning for the cataract itself it can be a central cataract or a peripheral cataract sometimes it looks like this see the little depression in the inferior part of the iris where you should suspect a genular injury here there is a silt cataract so you can go for a secondary eye implantation this is a total laceration with iris extrusion where the primary intention should be to restore the globe and this is a particular interlenticular foreign body can be easily taken out this is uh, subluxation where you should be ready with your all your uh, armamentarium like rings and hooks and if a dislocation like this refer it to show up the or rupakda and all two two rupox and please be very careful to look at the vitreous in the anterior chamber with the phacodonesis and we all know that around 48 percent of this is traumatic cataract can have an injury to the posterior segment so a gentle b scan is important to look out for the intraocular foreign body det detachments coral ruptures or the vitreous opacities of hemorrhage and additional imaging like ct scan or extra is important to look for uh, 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 foreign body in the or 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 orbit and other anterior segment oct and ubm are useful to look for a posterior cap capsular rupture or a position of the lens angle if there is asymmetry in the depth of the anterior chamber and also the integrated with genules. So uh, in an open globe injury, primarily it is important to restore the globe first. So uh, we use Tripan Blues which delineates fantastically the, the laceration and you repair the wound and as the anterior capsule is ruptured it is advisable through an SIC soon you can take out the cataractus lens and later you can basically um, you can take out the lens like this just like SICS and clean all the cortex and leave the eye to quieten down for some time and then plan for a secondary eye well you can have a better biometric measurement so the controversy like the primary or secondary uh, lens extraction the primary there is it is uh, lower cost and the time and less hospital admission it minimizes the risk of developing iop and saniki is decreasing visual evaluation time and decreasing risk of amblyopia but if we do secondary there is a potential for better accurate eye power and improve the visualization during surgery and you have the opportunity to operate in a quieter eye so this is a paper where the authors actually uh, this is a, a, a 30 consecutive case of open globe injury where the secondary implantation was done uh, following removal of a traumatic cataract 
and the authors uh, found that using biometry of the injured eye after primary repair was more accurate than using biometry of the fellow eye to determine the power of the lens eye implantation in the variable open globe injury. So in a secondary oil implantation also required if the patient requires a parcel eye vitrectomy, if requires the visualization is better if there is no eye evil and if you feel that there is a risk of endophthalmitis associated with an open globe trauma. So the checklist in OR, you can have all this multi-piece eye well has to be there. You should have a good vitrectomy machine, all the CTR, Sion readings and capsular readings, hooks are required if there is a lens subluxation and you need to stabilize the bag before implanting an intraocular lens in these cases. And post-op management depends on the type of injury and the object of injury. In many cases, as a common object being a vegetative matter like stick, broom stick, or juice stick, or bamboo stick that we saw, so in such cases, steroid should be avoided for some time, at least for the first three for four weeks. Post of antifungal drop can be added, antibiotic and mitriatic eye drop, lowering IOP with an aqueous sub suppressant, and steroids can be used in all blunt trauma cases and also in cases of trauma with metal object. So from here, we jump to. Uh, Traumatic glaucoma, uh, interestingly in the management of an ocular injury, the traumatic glaucoma is often overlooked and this is a prospective review of 100 uh, consecutive patients where it was found that the concussional glaucoma was actually responsible for almost 77% of these glaucomas where it was associated with at least two of these uh, like from traumatic cataract, angulization, iris injury and displacement of the lens and less from the penetrating injuries which causes synechia and lenticular displacement. So either following uh, glaucoma following con con contusion is either from a direct force where there is a damage by direct vector force or there is axial group compression with consequent circumferential elongation which cause damage to all the seven rings starting from the pupil, from pupillary tears like sphincter tear, dialysis of the iris, angle recession, cycle dialysis, meshwork tears, rupture genules and retinal dialysis. And classification of trauma-related glaucoma is usually classified in two groups, whether it's associated with closed trauma or open trauma. Closed is usually uh, most commonly seen in early onset is inflammation like cells, debris, uh, blood, etc. And also some amount of trabeculitis. If there is trabecular meshwork dis dis disruption, uh, it could be like either a superficial flap tear which appears like a wide band attached to the spar or it can be a full thickness rupture where the outer wall of Schlem's canal is seen like a white band when you do a gonioscopy and then there could be hyphema at the delayed onset the most common is angle recession followed by lens induced where the lens subluxation dislocation a lens particle glaucoma lens called particle uveitis or hemolytic or other ghost cell glaucomas like the rare ones so in a case of hyphema, mostly if it is around one third to half, half chamber hyphema, the topical steroid suppression and cytoplegics are enough, but we should give a special attention in cases of blood dystrachias and anticoagulants, the, and we should remember the chance of rebleed in the first seven days, and drain the blood when there is signs of corneal blood staining, total hyphema of intraocular pressure more than 25 for five days or clot persisting beyond 10 days, Angle recession, there is actually separation between the longitudinal and circular muscles of the iris where the iris is extended and we see an extended ciliary body band. Up to 100% of these eyes, uh, usually after significant hyphema, around 10% develop glaucoma, mostly where there is more than 180 or 240 degrees of recession. Gonioscopy we should do after six to eight weeks of blunt trauma compared with the other eye and usually they respond poorly to medical management. These are rare glaucomas like ghost cells, hemoceterotic and hemolytics. The lens-induced traumatic glaucoma is very important, like this, this lady who came to the OPD with 34 millimeter of mercury IOP, and there is usually a pupillary block either by subluxation or prolapse of the vitreous. You can buy time with iridectomies, but to monitor the angle, pass and intervene if the pass is more than 180 degrees, and eventually removal of the cataract is required, and lens cornea touch is an emergency. The glaucoma following open globe injury is usually the prevention of AC flattening. We can actually prevent secondary enclosure disease. 
To conclude, the traumatic cataracts are often accompanied by damage to other ocular structures which they pose a significant public health burden in that they disproportionately affect the young people and cause disability if not managed appropriately. Glaucoma related to ocular trauma is often overlooked or diagnosed late. Proper follow-up with IP measurement and, uh, uh, and periodic angle evaluation may prevent significant visual loss. Thanks for your kind attention. Thank you. Sorry, Thank Shubhita, you. there was Thank such a long talk. Great presentation. Alokesh, please. Uh, very good morning to you all. Thank you, SWB. I think Dr. Dibanjan Pal has covered all of the uh, important salient points. But uh, what would be our take-home message? Because we have to understand that even if we have a traumatic cataract or even if we diagnose a patient with concussion trauma to have glaucoma, we cannot overlook the other things that we should basically do while we are uh, examining this patient. So we should be absolutely sure to record vision in both eyes, even the eye without the trauma. If the patient has got no perception of light, we have to do an indirect ophthalmoscope light illumination in that eye in the dark room and verify that with your colleague and note it down. You have to give police intimation in certain cases. In case of penetrating or even blunt injury, Always, we should ideally do a CT scan. This has medical legal importance, actually. Also, do not forget to check for ocular movements and thereby advise for CT scans. Even with a patient who has ocular trauma and has got a secondary glaucoma and cataract, remember that same patient can have uh, orbital floor fracture. Don't overlook it. Never, never, never forget to record pupillary reactions. Always remember the seven rings, the limbal terrace. Always do gonioscopy unless and until the trauma is so much that the patient can find it intolerable. Always, always do gonioscopy, not only to identify angle recession, but also cyclodialysis craft. If you identify angle recession, then the pressure is not high. Be sure to document that you have informed the patient that he or she needs a regular follow-up and glaucoma may develop in angle recession glaucoma even after 20 years. Look for idiodialysis, the pupillary sphincter tear, which can, of course, interfere with your evaluation of relative afferent pupillary defect. Identify zonular dialysis, always do indirect ophthalmoscopy to identify peripheral tears, vitreous base avulsions and GRTs which are notorious for presenting later with retinal detachment. In a hazy media, be sure to do a USGB scan, try to rule out choroidal rupture, optic nerve avulsion, etc. because you have a cataract where you cannot uh, see the posterior pole well and you have a glaucoma and you treat it and once the media is clear, then you inform the patient that you can't have any vision because of choroidal rupture or optic nerve avulsion is not the way perhaps to go. Thank you. Thank you, Alokesh. Over to the panelists. Dr. Sagar, do you have anything to say? Yeah, excellent presentation from both uh, Alokesh, Dr. Alokesh and Dr. Dibanjan. Uh, just a couple of points I would like to add. Uh, uh, one thing is there, uh, which Dr. Laloka just mentioned about sphincter tears. What we should also do is that there are certain setups where the patients come to you with dilatation. So it is very important to document if there is traumatic metriasis to start with, because that uh, is an important parameter to decide when you take up them for take them up for surgery. Because you would not want to treat it with pupilloplasty also. The second point is that not all traumas will lead to zonular damage they can lead to zonular weakening also. So you need to look for subtle signs of zonular weakening. That's where gonioscopy might actually help. Gonioscopy, as rightly said, that will pick up recession, mm. pick up cleft. But zonular, uh, gonioscopy will also tell you that there is a zone where there is a subtle zonal weakness by just checking at the distance between the iris and the anterior, anterior lens capsule. And you compare this, the same uh, thing in the other eye. That will give you a clue that there is a zone of weakness. The third point, which probably is uh, may not be very important, but if you get, uh, if you're operating a traumatic cataract with a posterior synecy, it's a good idea to use iris hooks because that zone may have actual zonal weakness, which you which you would have missed it uh, preoperatively. Well, yes, I agree to the, uh, all those things uh, absolutely. I just wanted to mention that uh, when you're in a busy OPD, please what allocation has already highlighted, please 
have a look at the pupillary reaction because many a times this case is traumatic uh, cataracts will be obvious but traumatic glaucoma may come uh, very silently and only the pupillary reaction may be altered or there may be a sphincter tear, minimal sphincter tear that can lead to uh, uh, examination of the posterior segment which may reveal an advanced traumatic glaucoma with very high IOP when you dilate and see inside. But uh, if somehow these signs are missed, then patient can lead to have blindness. Because there are very practical scenarios where it happens, you just get to see a patient who is uh, I mean, nearly blind. And if you ask the patient only then the patient reveals that some trauma was there a few years back and everything was forgot, uh, for forgotten and everything became normal after uh, the initial treatments. And also sometimes the patient continues the steroids indefinitely since the time of trauma. That is uh, also one thing that has to be uh, counseled to the patient, please don't use it so regularly and I mean uh, be under medical supervision if you want to use it at all. So uh, these are the few things I wanted to add and uh, anything? Yeah, anything else? And I think uh, we have very great take home messages from this session. Thank you everyone for the lovely uh, discussion over here. And we'll move on to the next session. Shahid will. Uh, thanks ma'am. So after uh, all the cataracts, all glaucomas and all RDs, Welcome back to Oculoplasty. So, uh, Orbit is a, a Pandora's box, that's what it is called. And just like any other boxes, it has a lid, a floor and walls. And any damage or trauma to these walls can lead to leakage of all the misfortunes, just like it did for Pandora's. So how to deal with this uh, trauma of the Orbit? So we have amongst us our esteemed uh, guest speaker, uh, Dr. Tarjani Dave. She is an orbit and oculoplasty surgeon at LV Prasad Institute Hyderabad and also the associate director of LVPI. So, uh, as I invite, kindly welcome Dr. Tarjani. The discussant for the session is Dr. Anirban Bhaduri. He is a consultant in orbit and oculoplasty and ocular oncology at uh, Sushrut Eye Foundation and Research Center, uh, Kolkata. Sir, kindly have a seat, take your seat. Then uh, we have uh, our esteemed panelist, Professor Salil Mandal. Sir uh, is a professor of orbit oculoplasty and reconstructive surgery at uh, Regional Institute of Ophthalmology, Kolkata. Then uh, we have uh, Dr. Rajesh Majumdar Chaudhary. Sir uh, is a uh, oculoplasty surgeon, works in India and UK, and uh, she's a, he's a secretary of uh, West Bengal Ophthalmic Trust. So, with all the panelists and our discussant at the dice, uh, Dr. Tajan, you can start. I'll uh, request the speakers and the discussant uh, to kindly stick to the time, please. Thank you. All right. So, let me see if I get this right. So, Shubha Sakal. Ami Ajke Apnadar Mode Upastit Thatke Per Bhalo Kushi. Or maybe, <laughs> I don't know if I really got that right, but. Thank you so very much for having me here, Dr. Rajesh, Dr. Rupak, Shahid, my dear friend, Anir Ban and Dr. Mandal. Uh, I'm going to take you through certain aspects of management of orbital trauma. I hope I can make my slides advance. All right. So I have no financial disclosures to make. You will be seeing certain full face photographs of my patients for which we have the consent in place. The objectives that I want to take you through are listed there. I want to take you through um, how you think about a case of trauma. Is the structure important? Is the function important? Or do you think in terms of importance of that organ? And with this, I'm going to summarize a six-point approach that we should all have when we see a case of orbital trauma. And then I'll get into certain specific cases that you see following trauma such as infections, foreign bodies, CCFs, fractures, and what do we have in our kitty alongside the talent in terms of technology. These 10 points would largely summarize my talk. We are aware that the primary function of the orbit is to protect. And what does it protect? The very delicate eyeball and the optic nerve, the muscles, 
and the so many tissues that you have in the orbit. So along with its buttresses, these bones have the major function of protecting the soft tissue. So how do you look at any patient with orbital trauma? Do you look at the structures involved? We've been going that way since morning, right? Eyelid, lacrimal system, so on and so forth. Or do you look at the function? Or do you look at the importance? In my understanding, the last part is significant. And it, all, it is also very, very practical. Whenever I see a patient of trauma, whatever trauma, the first thing is vision. You can never ignore that and it is of paramount importance. So no matter what amount of florid orbital involvement you see, there always has to be an attempt to look at what's happening to the vision. You might have to retract the eyelids, it might be tense eyelids, you might have to rely on other measures, you might have to ask the patient uh, indirect to use the light, whatever it is, but at least an estimate of whether the patient has perception and accurate projection of rays is very important. Certain times you might be called to a multi-speciality where you have no means of checking and then at times certain apps come in ha handy. Just recording hand movement vision nicely is also good enough from the medical standpoint. The second, in my opinion, is an open glow, which again takes precedence over any form of orbital trauma. Even if you have a fracture lurking behind, but you have an open globe, that open globe takes priority and the fracture can be always repaired in a secondary sitting. And it's very easy to identify open globe injuries. Certain times a tense eyelid may not allow you to look at the globe contour, uh, but always avert the eyelid. If you have imaging, look at the soft tissue shadow and see whether it's regular or not. In patients who have other signs such as subconjunctival hemorrhages, if it is flat, the pupil is round and reacting, anterior chamber is formed, you're obviously not suspecting an open globe. But when you have bullous schemosis and you see if you have a scan available and you see that the coats of the eye are not very regular, you're obviously suspecting an open globe and you transfer this patient to your anterior segment and retina colleagues. Quite often, I have a situation where the patient is just not aware but is in thysis bulbi and you are going ahead and trying to repair a fracture of the zygoma. But it's always important to recognize that thysis bulbi, that soft globe, tell the patient that this is not for your vision and then move ahead with the repair of the orbital trauma. Now, after you've ruled out an op open globe, traumatic optic neuropathy, in my opinion, takes precedence. So if I see that there's a fracture, if it is impinging on the optic nerve, I'd still go ahead and correct that fracture because of the impingement. But if that fracture is not really impinging on the optic nerve, I'd only rely on the neuro-ophthalmology colleagues to give IVMP initially, go all guns blazing on the steroid, and then look at what has to be done for the fracture. Once you've looked at optic neuropathy, an unprotected globe is an emergency. So this slide says it all. If you have an upper eyelid avulsion or loss of tissue, you're going to have exposure and eventually the cornea is going to melt. So your focus is always on looking at reconstructing that eyelid, even if it is in the primary sitting. And once you've done all of this, you look at trauma per se of the orbit. In that situation, if you have a white eyed blowout fracture, there was a fracture, but it just sprang back and went back in its position. But what has it left? It's left an entrapped muscle in the maxillary sinus, which can incite a vasovagal and bradycardia and is a systemic risk for the child. So this is an emergency as soon as you've ruled out traumatic optic neuropathy and you go ahead and repair it. And once you've done all of this, you look at rest of the adenexa. So in my opinion, whenever I see uh, a patient with trauma, I go by these six points. I don't look at the structure, I don't look at the function, I look at the importance of those structures and vision, open globe, tron, exposed eyeball, muscle entrapment, and then adnexal injury is the flowchart that I'd like to follow. Now, certain things in periorbital trauma, if you have bleeding, um, that's priority. You have to look at all measures of taking care of the bleeding. You can give cold compresses. Very important, ask the patient not to blow his nose. Otherwise, you'd be left with a patient like this. This is not edema. This is not ecchymosis. This is just plain and simple air, which is sitting in the orbit through a medial wall fracture. At times, this air can go behind and compress on the optic nerve as well, because the orbit is a closed compartment. So you want to give that instruction correct. 
Following trauma, you can have other instances of a red-hot orbit. Two cases here. Both of these are cellulitis following trauma. The importance of the second one, the older child, is in those situations you tend to see anaerobic infections, gas-producing organisms. This black dot over here is gas. And there your antibiotic therapy is going to change. So you can have infections occurring following trauma. Another red hot eye following trauma, you see vessels like this. This is telltale, keratococavernous fistula. And if you image the patient, you'll actually be able to see a dilated superior ophthalmic vein, which has a course that goes from lateral to medial. And if you were to look at the coronal sections, you'll see it between the superior rectus LPS and the optic nerve as a dilated structure here, which is the dilated SOV versus the regular caliber of the SOV. Obviously, MRI forms the imaging of choice, but then the finances dictate what you do for these patients. You send them to an intervention radiologist, they take care of treatment. Sometimes a CCF following trauma can present as a red hot eye like this. Um, and it's the imaging which comes to your rescue at that point of time. Yet another red hot orbit following trauma. And you see an entry wound over here. These are wooden foreign bodies which should not be missed. CT is obviously not the imaging of choice, but quite often is the first modality you ask for because you want to look at the bony anatomy as well. You'll see it as a hypodense structure and it's a little different from air that you see in the orbit in terms that foreign bodies tend to have a more linear shadow, air tends to have a more globular shadow on uh, imaging. And obviously these need to be removed, there's no option there. Certain times you can have a smoldering wooden foreign body sitting over there, not producing a red hot orbit, but still has to be suspected when you have that kind of a history uh, that the patient gives. And like I told you, MRI tends to show the foreign body much better than what CT would. Certain other foreign bodies, now these are metallic foreign bodies, very far from the optic nerve, had an open globe, underwent the entire jing bang of posterior segment uh, trauma management. You don't want to touch this because it's not near the optic nerve, it's not going to produce siderosis. But this, very close to the optic nerve there, this is catch-22, you want to remove it, but removal is also difficult. And that's where some amount of technology can also come in handy if you have image guidance in your kitty. The last part is on uh, trauma and fractures. And here we've started using talent along with technology. You have a lot of hidden incisions that can be used to give you a very good outcome of trauma surgery. So it's not just the um, talent, but also the addition of technology such as image guided surgery, where here you see a fracture repair. And once the plate has been placed and you put your navigation probe on it, it will tell you where exactly the plate is sitting posteriorly, medially, and you know you've given good coverage to the fracture. You have several ready-made beautiful implants, but at times you do not have implants that cover for irregular defects, such as what you see in this patient who had a frontal bone osteomyelitis following trauma with an absent roof over there. And these are situations where technology comes in handy. It helps you fabricate an implant like this, which covers, it's like fitting a jigsaw puzzle. It covers not only the frontal bone, but also the roof of the orbit and makes your surgery much, much, much easier. This is crafted. Just give me 30 more seconds. This is crafted using um, the technology of 3D printing and is usually made in titanium. Even for orbital floor fractures, which are difficult to correct with your run-of-the-mill implants, 3D uh, printing comes in very handy. I just want to end with two cases. This is the first one where I got very uh, taken away with so many fractures, so many walls, being an orbital surgeon, that I actually took this patient up for repair on table. And only on table when I started to tag the inferior rectus did I realize that there's a splinter of bone which is uh, actually perforated the eyeball and is going right through creating a uh, penetrating injury into the eyeball. And I saw vitreous which I'm not very comfortable with and had to call a retina colleague to help us out. Similarly, did a very beautiful fracture repair, but realized that there's hardware that's actually blocking the lacrimal duct, which later on led to the patient developing acute dacryocystitis and had to perform a DCR4. So um, orbital surgery is very, very humbling in my opinion, and I've covered these points that I listed out for you with certain case examples. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tarjani Dave, for having covered the spectrum of orbital injuries so nicely. 
I will re-emphasize what she said when she talked about these six points. So this very nicely sets up the order of precedence of what you need to examine. And there can never be overemphasis on examination of vision. By hook or crook, that is information that is vital to your further management. I'll just move on a little bit. Uh, as an ophthalmologist, sometimes we do not come high on the order of priority because eventually life is more important. So the three most vital things that happen when you see a patient is whether the patient has an airway, whether the patient is breathing and is the circulation intact. Then of course comes whether the patient is mobile, is the patient responsive or is the patient unconscious. And then there is a the question of exposure. So you need to examine whether the patient has other injuries, a head injury, a closed in chest injury, abdominal injuries with bleeding. So these are life-threatening injuries. And after the patient is stabilizes when the ophthalmologist comes into the picture. Now even here, life-threatening injuries take precedence. So I had the opportunity of working in multi-speciality hospital in the past. And that always would be the first contact. So you would be informed by the neurosurgeon or the maxillofacial surgeon and your patient examination would probably be in ICU where sometimes you would have to do the repair on a comatose patient, soft tissue repairs, where the patient could not be taken to an operation theatre. In the operation theatre, you would often be working with your other colleagues. So it could be an orthopedic surgeon who's repairing the limbs while you do the globe repair or the soft tissue repairs or the maxillofacial surgeon who initiates the facial repair and then as an orbital surgeon you step in and complete the floor of the medial wall repairs. So the indications for orbital fracture repairs is very simple. It's either to release an entrapment or it is because you have enophthalmos because of a large fracture. Uh, we'll go on. So what I'm trying to emphasize is that there are situations where teamwork does wonders. And I'll just show one example. This is the first fracture which I had encountered when, when I returned to Calcutta. And this patient had a large ZMC fracture with significant enophthalmos as well as you can see the globe is depressed. So this is where you come second. The maxillofacial surgeon takes over. He repairs the facial complex. That is when you get a rim and you can go ahead and repair the floor. So this is what happened subsequently. You can see the mini plates here which has repaired the inferior rim and then you go ahead and uh, do the floor repair and this is what happens subsequently. So teamwork is always better. Another situation where you as an oculoplastic surgeon can uh, help out. So this is a patient with this uh, large NOE fracture with a stoved in maxilla and the entire nasal acromal duct, uh, system is ripped off. So where, where do you come in? You can go ahead and do an intubation in the OR before the fracture repair is initiated. And then, of course, you can help in with the soft tissue repair, and this is how it is. One thing that uh, Tarjani spoke about, and I want to re-emphasize, is because these patients keep coming to us. So you look at the eye movements, a white eye, child with diplopia, they are often misdiagnosed because they are vomiting, so there is a suspicion of a head injury, or they are taken as patients with an acute abdomen because of their symptoms, simply because of the fact that they have an ocular cardiac reflex. But what they actually have is a small fracture with an entrapment. This is a very recent patient. This patient was actually diagnosed a month later. Okay, small fracture here with a little bit of soft tissue entrapment. And look at the difference in the eye movements here. Okay, I still have time. Oh, that is surprising. <laughs> I took away that yeah. extra time. <laughs> so, so, simple. Since I still have 55 seconds, when your patient comes to you, there are certain basic things that you want to look at. So, the emphysema is something that you see at the very beginning. Okay, patients may or may not have hemorrhages around the eye. A good question would be, do you have a nosebleed? Okay, that often tells you that you have a fracture either in the medial wall or sometimes in the floor. And always tell them, please don't blow your nose. Because the next thing is you have the eyeball coming out. Questions? Okay, uh, yeah, excellent presentations, uh, Tarjani and uh, sir. So uh, I have a question to uh, RMC, sir. So we have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, non oculoplasty persons and general of health amongst us who would like to uh, refer the patient to uh, an oculoplasty surgeon of orbital fracture. So what medical management they should do before uh, referring the patient to an oculoplasty person? What all they should do before referring the patient uh, to us? 
Um, Shahid, I think, you know, uh, all these people have done such a great job, made our job very easy. One thing I would like to mention is to look for an orbital compartment syndrome. I think it's commoner than we think it is. And the management of the orbital compartment syndrome, I think it's our responsibility that we, all of us learn that. It can be done at, you know, a office setting actually. So basically, when you have a high orbital pressure, which can cause optic nerve damage, uh, this is orbital compartment syndrome. And to treat that is very, you know, easily done. There are a lot of papers, a lot of YouTube videos. You basically, you think about learning the technique of doing a canthotomy and an inferior cantholysis. And I would add that, you know, doing a septal release, inferior septal release along with that is a great ploy to save vision. So it's very important that you all of us learn that. And if any one of us wants to see how it's done, we are welcome to visit Dr. Mandal's clinic, uh, Dr. Anirvan Bhadur's clinic, Dr. Shait Alam's clinic, or you can come to my clinic as well and we can you know, discuss how it's done. I think this is an important skill we should all acquire. Okay, yeah, thanks sir, Th uh, about that uh, nice point about orbital, orbital compartment syndrome. Uh, Salil sir, uh, Tajni showed a lot of implants, like most of them titaniums. So I'm aware that still at some centers, especially the government uh, hospitals, we are still using that uh, elastic sheets. So do you have any experience with those silicon sheets or like are, are we still Hello. using that? Hello. Uh, I am not using a silicon slate, but I am using a titanium plate, okay. which is in a blowout fracture in the inferior orbital. That is common in orbital blowout fracture that is in the inferior wall. So uh, a titanium plate is very easy to uh, implant it. And you also it's, uh, have a screw fixation, and uh, the result is good. But uh, what I am highlighting about this uh, presentation is that this is my uh, personal experience that in a case of uh, injuries, uh, particularly in a periodic age group, the intraorbital organic material, that the patient have a, ch a child who is just uh, playing sometimes that is impacted foreign wood in the orbit, which is not diagnosed by any of the hospital. After some days, 15 days, they develop an orbital cellulitis. That cellulitis leads to an orbital abscess. So I referred to one hospital, to another hospital, they gave a conservative management. But none of the uh, doctors, they're not doing an imaging system. This is my advice is to that, that first to do in a, the patient in a pediatric age group with the trauma, First, in if the patient having orbital cellulitis or orbital abscess, first to do an imaging, whether there is an interorbital foreign body or not. I have they did five cases. After one month, I do a minimal invasive orbitotomy and diagnose this retained intraocular foreign body without damage the scleral wall and the optic nerve. So I did one from the supramedial continent, the minimal invasive. Uh, Orbitotomy and remove the orbit, big foreign body, and three from the infralateral or orbital uh, compartment. So my advice in a periodic gooch, if any ad, uh, orbital axis there, do imaging, diagnose whether there is interorbital foreign body or not. Particularly if there is organic material is there, there must be a, a orbital cellulitis. And within a few days, it becomes abscess formation. Ultimately, if you not diagnose, the patient becomes. So, interorbital foreign body is very important. You have to remove any way, otherwise, very difficult. So, this is my to, uh, message to all the resident. If the patient have an orbital abscess in a pediatric age group, do imaging system, diagnose what is the cause. Otherwise, it is refer one hospital to another hospital. I have my personal experience. Three times the resident drain abscess, but still there is interorbital foreign body. At the last time, when two times orbital abscess is drained, finally I have done. I have seen the big foreign body inside the orbit. When it is removed, the patient is cured. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you everyone. And uh, in the interest of time, we'd like to conclude this session. And our next session is on. Uh, management of mid-phase trauma and Dr. Uh, uh, Sabita would be moderating this. Uh, thank you, Shahid. So, I invite the next speaker, Dr. Rajashree Banerjee. Banerjee. 
Rajoshi Banerjee, sorry, maxillofacial surgeon uh, with the Amri Hospitals. Uh, he'll be the speaker. Dr. Rajoshi, please. Shahid Alam will be discussing and uh, he is in the Department of Orbit and Oculoplasty at Shankar Netralaya. And Dr. Kostav Roy, maxillofacial surgeon attached to Trauma Care Center, SSK and Arantego, please come onto the stage. He will be the panelist for the session. Good morning, uh, dear colleagues. It is a privilege to speak on such a forum and I am honored that the Ophthalmological Society of West Bengal have invited us to me and Dr. Kosta. We belong to the same fraternity. Uh, thanks to Dr. RMC as well. And the previous, uh, I have little bit to add to what the previous session uh, by Dr. Dave and Dr. Bhaduri uh, spoke on. And that is about meat face fractures. Just a little bit of recap. Now, the, the, we divide them, uh, the fractures into three levels, that is the Lefort 1 level, that is just above the level of the nasal floor uh, and uh, the level, the Lefort 2, which is uh, also known as the pyramidal fracture because of the shape and Lefort 3 is craniofacial disjunction. Now, these blue and pink lines that we can see here is the uh, the buttresses or the struts where the maxillofacial surgeons would like to put the fixation devices on to stabilize the facial skeleton. These are the fixation devices in situ as in a Lefort uh, 1 fracture. The, uh, the crucial thing is to have at least two screws on either side of the fracture so that the fragments do not rotate along the screws axis. This is the fixation for the Lee 4, 2 and 3 fractures. This is the zygomatic complex fractures. Uh, you can see we also call it a tripod fracture because of the shape. Uh, and the zygoma always uh, will involve the fractures of the lateral wall of the orbit and the floor, part of the floor of the orbit as well. The clinical findings would be facial asymmetry, increase in facial width and cheek flattening, uh, periorbital echymosis uh, or crepitus, infraorbital nerve numbness, lateral canthal dystopia, trismus, diplo binocular diplopia and occlusal disorder. Fixation types, one point versus two point, two points are more stable. Then you have three point and four point fixations. This is a case of pan facial trauma. This uh, is the classification by Markowitz on the fracture of the medial wall of the orbit. In type one, as you can see, the medial canthal attachment is uh, is there. Uh, it is uh, pit uh, is uh, with a big piece of bone on the medial wall. So the fixing the big piece of bone will be adequate. And on and if we go on to the type 3 and the more complex trauma where there is a canthal detachment, we may have to go for canthopexy. Now the examinations in these uh, cases of NOE fractures, the, the, we should look for the airway as already been discussed. Anosmia is a problem, CSF rhinorrhea and a loss of dorsal strut support. Uh, you can see an implant with a bone graft here in one of these cases. Uh, in the middle and the ocular examination I don't need to elaborate on we also we need the uh, input of the ophthalmology colleagues all the time now this is a bowstring test to evaluate whether uh, this uh, the medial canthus is still attached to the ten, uh, to the uh, infraorbital wall uh, uh, or the middle orbital wall and sometimes the bimanual tests are done in uh, cases of bilateral trauma. Telecanthus, as you can see, uh, is the lateral displacement of the medial canthal tendon. There is transverse shortening of the palpebral fissure in this case, which causes an aesthetic issue. Some of these slides, I must acknowledge, have been taken from 
the Association of Osteosynthesis, uh, which is the guiding body which uh, recommends where to put the plates, mini plates and screws. And uh, this is one such slide showing the fixation methods of the type 1, 2 and 3 fractures of the medial wall of the orbit. You can see some screws in the glabular region. They are used to, you know, uh, as a sling. The, the canthopexy sutures are used as a sling on the other side of the, you know, here. We don't have a pointer, right? Uh, this is, is the, the transnasal wires goes from this medial canthus and gets attached to this screw over here. And there's another plate over here. The, on the other side, it goes and fixes to that thing. So, now th sometimes we need a bone graft for the dorsal nasal support. This is a, usually a calvarial bone graft, easy to obtain. Now, soft tissue adaptation is important. This is a bolster splint, uh, which will, you know, adapt the uh, na nasal soft tissues but uh, it will not be uh, adequate to maintain can medial canthal tendon position. This just prevents pseudo telecanthus. This is one of our cases, uh, a team of uh, maxillofacial and neurosurgeon at MRI hospitals, we did this case. Severe NOE trauma with telecanthus and depressed fractures of the outer table of the frontal bone and the NOE complex as a, as a whole. This is after reduction, the post-operative case, and the, you can see the, uh, it, there is a reasonable degree of correction of the telecanthus as well as the contour of the NOE region. This is another case. This patient had an automobile accident uh, and, uh, in Tripura, and this is how he came, and we retrieved a, a piece of foreign body from the frontal sinus in this particular case. I still remember a piece of hand, handle or some metallic object. And this is the post-op. Now this boy came to me after a road traffic accident, fall from motorcycle, and it was uh, his fracture. He had an NOE fracture and was not stable uh, on a normal reduction. Now we, uh, I decided to you know, raise a bicoronal flap and uh, fixation, and there were frontal fractures as well only the outer table, so we could manage with the fixation of the outer table with mini plates and that is the outcome. Now, fractures of the medial orbital wall are characterized by periorbital bruising, conjunctival hemorrhage, enophthalmos, uh, visual acuity changes, extraocular motility reduction, restriction, diplopia, paresthesia of the infraorbital nerve and pain on motion uh, of the eye. The diagnostic evaluation is usually CT scan and uh, force duction test can be performed to evaluate whether there is muscle entrapment. Now the axial cuts of the scan are good to identify the lateral and medial wall fractures and uh, the medial and lateral rectus muscle shape. The coronal cuts are good for the floor and medial wall fractures and we can also measure the fracture size and of course the uh, shape of the inferior and medial rectus. The sagittal cuts are good to ex know the extent, the posterior extent of the fractures of the orbit. And there are floor fractures we, uh, which uh, we have to be aware of the trapdoor fractures as you all know and, uh, and the posterior medial fractures are usually associated with a higher degree of enophthalmos. Now, medial wall fractures are isolated fractures, sometimes are e e easily missed um, unless we examine carefully, we obtain a CT scan for the patient and it can result in diplopia and enophthalmos. Roof fractures, there is blow-in type of fractures, we have proptosis, vertical dystopia, diplopia, etc. and globe pressure will need decompression done by the ophthalmic surgeons. The indications of surgery will be evidence of entrapment, vertical globe malposition, enophthalmos, and the size and location of the fracture, usually more than 50% behind the equator of the globe, we need to open up the orbit, uh, the floor, 
and uh, the principles of orbital fracture correction is as maxillofacial surgeons we would prefer to fix the rim first the orbital rim and we need to place the appropriate implants and uh, and and the the approaches will be the upper eyelid incisions in this case we get, get good access to the frontozygomatic suture the lateral orbital wall the lateral canthus and the lower eyelid incisions as you all know we have the subconjunctival transconjunctival the mid tarsal and the uh, infraorbital incisions are good for the floor the rim and the body dissection i won't elaborate on this because you are experts in this line just go to the take home messages would be accurate diagnosis and planning reconstruction of the orbital rim before the walls and appropriate implants and correct positioning is important and it should be evaluated by ct scan uh, either intra or post op thank you very much thank you dr rajesh sheik dr shahid please good afternoon everyone so at the outset i would like to thank uh, oswb rkb da and dr rajesh sir for giving me this opportunity so uh, i'll be talking a little bit about uh, mid face trauma and its implications few points regarding management so these are the uh, leap four uh, type of fracture that has uh, already been covered by rajesh sir so what are the important clinical and radi radiological signs so there are several signs like skin hypostasia emphysema step deformity but uh, the two important signs that we should be aware of are uh, csf rhinorrhea that is uh, commonly seen in skull based fractures and uh, the pulsating exophthalmos uh, which is a telltale sign of an underlying uh, ccf and here uh, we see uh, it's a nemo encephalon with uh, the typical mount fuji sign seen here so this tells us that in, in uh, all cases of trauma we should apart from ordering an, uh, a city orbit we should ob order a city orbit including brain so this is a case i would like to share here though this patient came to an emergency had a history of trauma a week back and with this picture complete motility restriction chemosis and was being managed as orbital cellulitis elsewhere with this ct scan pictures so if you remember what dr tajini had shown uh, in her uh, presentation a case of orbital cellulitis so apart from that orbital inflammation the extraocular muscles were normal but what you see here the extraocular muscles are quite thick as compared to the other side so this uh, raised a suspicion and then uh, we ordered an mri and this is what mri shows a dilated supraophthalmic vein dilated cavernous sinus so it's a catet cavernous fistula which was uh, being misdiagnosed as orbital cellulitis so this case uh, we published also so we should be aware about like uh, how to how to uh, differentiate between a case of of infection from an uh, underlying ccf this is another case so uh, two days back an eyelid tear repair was done and then patient came back to came to emergency so this case was also uh, showed by dr tajini here so patient uh, with a complete you know a uh, closure of eyelid proptosis complete uh, motility deficiency we could not open the eyelids and this is what the ct scan showed so here you, you can see that uh, there is orbital emphysema and air has entered into the orbit of the medial wall fracture so it's in the uh, superior orbit in the medial orbit so and patient had a, a dilated pupil the uh, movement uh, vision was hand movement so an emergency we did an emergency canthotomy and cantholysis it was a case of orbital compartment syndrome this is how the patient is after uh, management and vision was 624 because uh, she, he had al also a foveal scar so this is an interesting paper a review article on trauma of the mid face so what i would like to point here is so this this paper al has almost covered around some 300 articles they have taken into account and what i found surprising was that in the whole of the paper the authors have talked about orbital fractures so and, and that's what i i like i would like to point here that that the trauma of mid face is not about all about fractures we have soft tissue involved also and if it is if a fracture repair is not done properly so this is what happens here you see that implant has been placed through the nasolacrimal duct and it has it has almost transected the nasolacrimal duct 
so we had some seven cases and uh, like this where the implant was was either compressing the sac or the nasolacrimal duct causing an iatrogenic nasolacrimal duct obstruction so we published this case series also so while placing an implant especially uh, while tackling the medial wall we should be be careful about the lacrimal duct and the, the lacrimal system so for me the mid phase uh, like what I feel is it like when uh, uh, we, we, we take the mid face as a whole so it's a, it's a lower eyelid, the medial canthus, the lateral canthus and the zygoma and in the most of the cases, in, in late cases what we need to tackle is the psychiatrician ectropion of the, of, the, of the lower eyelid and it's difficult because the graft take up here is quite challenging because sometimes the graft is placed directly on the bone. So this is a case from Bangladesh here. So this case here, apart from all the implants that we had played, the three-point fixation was done, we had to also tackle this, this, this lower lid portion, the ptosis, the lateral canthus, and this is a picture after placement of the implant. And just to share with you the last case here, this patient presented to me a few days back with history of trauma and, and ptosis with eyelid restriction. But what you see in, in CT scan, in both the sagittal and coronal curves, that there is no fracture at all. There is no, no, there is no entrapment. Here you can see that there is a little bit of discontinuity, but there is no entrapment of muscle. But still there is, there is elevation restriction and there is pseudotosis. On, uh, when the patient fixates with the other eye, the tosis gets corrected. So it's a case of acquired monoocular elevation deficiency syndrome, though rare, but these things have to be taken into account. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shahid. I mean, very well uh, shown as to how we should be careful about uh, eye areas, ocular areas and mid-face traumas. Dr. Kostov. Would you like to add something to what has already been said? Uh, good afternoon. Um, I think my previous speakers have covered everything in detail. But um, one thing I would suggest that uh, planning is utmost important. As earlier they said that there has to be amalgamation in technology as well as the skill. So having a particular skill set always uh, doesn't optimize the result. So if we have, depending on the setup that we are working, if you have a navigation, then that's a wonderful thing to have. Like uh, Dr. Shahid pointed out that when we're placing a screw, mistakenly it can go and injure the nasolacrimal yes. dust, which is a disaster. So if you have navigation, that can be avoided. Or even uh, with the recent advent of technology, we have 3D models, which can be printed, which gives a, a gross idea what kind of a deformity we are dealing. So I think uh, there are a lot of developments and uh, innovations that are coming into this field. So if we can um, kind of amalgamate all this, I think we can optimize the outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We had a great session. Thank you, Dr. Kostov, Shahid, and Rajesh. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was. Injury to the inferior rectus, sir. There was no entrapment, but there is injury to the inferior rectus. Inferior rectus is entrapped. No, no. Yeah, it's intact. There's no. It's not entrapped, but there is injury. There is direct muscle injury. Oh, okay. okay yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, trauma to optic now when managing optic neuropathy is a real dilemma. Like uh, whenever such a case presents to us, like we are in a doubt whether to observe, start the patient on steroids into a neurosurgeon. So, like that all will be dealt about our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Rashmin Gandhi. Uh, sir was attached to Shankar Nitralia Chennai for a, quite a long period of time and has been featured to uh, uh, like uh, many of us and has excellent uh, teaching skills apart from being an excellent surgeon. He is director of uh, Foresight Worldwide and is a consultant at uh, Center for Sight Hyderabad. So, sir will be talking on uh, management of optic nerve trauma. So, and uh, to discuss upon, we have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sujata Guha. Uh, Ma'am is medical director of, of Shankar Nitralia, senior consultant, heading the department of pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus and neuroophthalmology, and an excellent cataract surgeon. She has also been a teacher to like many of us. So, Ma'am uh, will be discussing uh, after uh, Sir has uh, talked on management of optic nerve trauma. Our panelists for today are Tanmay, uh, Dr. Tanmay Biswas, <coughs> consultant uh, Netralium, and uh, Dr. Manidipa Banerjee, who is a consultant in Department of Pediatric Ophthal, Strabismus and Neurophthal, Shankar Netralia, Rajarhat branch. So, yeah, kindly take your seats.
So, uh, <clears throat> one of the one of the prime uh, attraction, if I have to say, for my visits to Bengal, is uh, my assault to the unsuspecting, innocent people with my Bengali. And that's what I started when I landed today with my driver. And within two sentences, my driver who, who belongs to Krishnagar, heart of Bengal, uh, reverted in Hindi and English. And I realized that I should concentrate on trauma rather than Bengali. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. I always enjoy my visits here. I thank uh, uh, Rajeshda, Shahid, uh, Rupak for inviting me here. We're going to talk about, I, I've broadened the topic a little bit to talk about uh, other facets of neuroophthalmology and trauma as well. Uh, before we start, uh, it used to be believed that optic nerve is like a tube and it transmits all the spirit from the atmosphere to the brain and that's how you react to the atmosphere. So in 18th century, a British uh, researcher, Water Bailey, that's not Water Bailey, that's not a photograph of Water Bailey. Water Bailey thought that, oh, so if the optic nerve is not functioning, that means the spirit which has gone through the optic nerve, uh, that's, that's malfunctioning, that's not a good spirit. And you have to take the spirit out, whether it's a trauma or inflammation, you need to take the spirit out from, that, uh, from the skull. And what is suggested, and in his uh, chest, uh, British English, draweth vapors out of the head and removeth from the sight. So to improve sight, what is suggested is that we should probably ask the patient to comb four or five times a day and that will take the spirit out. Obviously, he didn't think about a particular group of people if they get traumatic optic neuropathy or optic neuritis, what would happen to them. So from there, we have come a long way, but not a very long way. These are the basic questions that I want to answer in a patient with traumatic optic neuropathy. Would you order a CT scan or MRI scan if you have a patient with uh, trauma? What is the role of electrodiagnostics? And about the treatment, uh, steroids, and surgical intervention. So let's look at the first question. Would you order CT scan or MRI scan? By and large, in a trauma where you, uh, when you don't have a proper history, I personally prefer a CT scan for two reasons. If you don't know whether there is a metallic foreign body, then uh, obviously MRI would do more harm than good. And CT scan would delineate the bone fragments better. So if, you, if the patient has an optic canal fracture or a bone fragment sitting on an optic nerve, a CT scan would highlight it better. However, uh, if patient who has a profound loss of vision and patient who has a thickened optic nerve, MRI also has a role to play because that will delineate optic nerve sheath hematoma better. So in a profound loss of vision, uh, a CT scan does not show any foreign body. Sometimes you might have to even ask for MRI scan. What about VEP? What is the role of VEP? Uh, there are multiple papers which suggest that VEP can be used as a prognostication factor. If patient who has uh, at least a 50% of amplitude on VEP, you know that those patients might recover from a traumatic optic neuropathy. And if there is a complete loss on a VEP on presentation, you know that maybe those patients will not do very well in the long run. Uh, apart from that, uh, and we probably would hear about it a little later in the day, all these patients with trauma would have some amount of medical legal uh, angle and so VEP would also play a role uh, in documenting these injuries. Now what about the treatment? So is there any evidence-based treatment? Well, uh, to be frank, a short answer is no. There are no recommendations which can be given based on the current literature which is available. But we will go through that maze of literature to say what is a current accepted practice in the management of traumatic optic neuropathy. So this was one of the first studies which was done in 1996. Uh, it was called uh, Traumatic Optic Neuropathy Trial, which was done by Alfredo Sadun and his group, where 58 patients of uh, traumatic optic neuropathy, uh, 23 were treated with steroids, and 25 had optic canal decompression and steroids, while the 10 patients were observed. And what they found is that people who underwent only observation had no visual improvement versus 
uh, people who had both decompression and cortic steroids, they had a maximum rate of uh, improvement. So if you look at this study in isolation, you will say that, oh, you should be giving steroids for everybody who has traumatic optic neuropathy and should be operating on them. However, the later studies suggested that this evidence is not really irrefutable. Uh, and there are some 16 major studies since 1990, but they all suffer from quite a few flaws. Most of them uh, were retrospective, small sample sizes, controls lacking and whatnot. This was a study, so uh, a lot of data on steroids in optic nerve then was derived from larger trials which are done on spinal cord study and a, uh, and a brain injury study. Spinal cord study, they found that if you give megadose steroids, the patient who had spinal cord injury and received megadose steroids, they did better than the patient who did not receive megadose steroids. So we exported this and say that why don't we give megadose steroids in patients with uh, optic nerve injury as well. Uh, but this was a study which was done by uh, Kenneth Stensepper. It, it, it was on a mouse model in the laboratory where he found that actually higher the dose of steroids, lesser would be axonal recovery. In other words, if you keep giving me megadose steroids, those patients had fewer neurons which survived at the end of six weeks versus the animals which received only saline. So this study actually said that, oh, megadose steroids may or may not work, but it may be harmful. So uh, based on all this, what is the current, uh, current markup? So th these are the levels of uh, uh, evidence for any treatment that you want to do. There are some treatments that you must do, level one. Should do, could do, and then the last one, voodoo. I mean, you, you do the treatment, sometimes it works, sometimes it does not work. Where does the steroid stand? I think it's in can do. You can give steroids uh, is what we feel. Why do you give? Because most of these optic nerves would have oxidative stress. Uh, RGC damage because retinal ganglion cell layer damage because of uh, oxidative stress and inflammation. So maybe steroid has a role, has a significant role if you give it in first 48 hours. First week uh, may be given under guarded visual prognosis. But one thing is quite clear that we should not be using megadose steroids because it, it is clear from the laboratory investigation that megadose steroids would harm the optic nerve recovery. It was also corroborated by a brain uh, trauma trial called CRASH study where they said that megadose steroids patient who received megadose steroids had a higher mortality. So that is about the steroids and uh, surgical treatment. The bottom line is that yeah, steroids can be given, maybe given one gram a day for three to five days, followed by oral steroids. This is the second point I wanted to highlight in the setting of trauma. This was a patient which was shared by our mentor, Dr. Navin J. Kumar. He had this patient who came from abroad and said that I was hit on the head repeatedly by the soldiers and after that my eyesight gradually went down. He was told locally in his country that uh, you are suffering from uh, traumatic optic neuropathy and nothing can be done. He came to India for a second opinion and this is how his optic nerves look like. His vision was poor in the right eye and you can clearly see that there is a right optic atrophy. However, which was, what was missed out and this is something which we should always remember is that patients said that vision actually gradually went down. Sometimes when you have patient who has no PL in one eye in the setting of trauma, you miss out on the other eye. Here you can see in the other eye, patient actually has what is known as a bow tie optic atrophy. So this patient was subjected to MRI scan and was actually found to have pituitary adenoma. The trauma was incidental. So uh, another uh, important point in the setting of trauma is the history point. Any patient who has a gradually progressive loss of vision should be uh, subjected to all the optic nerve function tests, to RAPD as was mentioned in previous setting, uh, previous talks, and color vision. This is the last patient, history of trauma, patient who fell down, had a severe neck injury, his glasses broke, he came with eye pain and headache, and this is how his pupils look like. And you can see there is an anisocoria. Uh, so uh, this is another patient where patient has anisocoria, which is worse in a dim light. So patient who has anisocoria and headache in the setting of trauma, again, don't miss out dissecting carotid aneurysm, which can be a presenting feature. Post-traumatic dissecting carotid aneurysm can present to us. 50% of these patients present to ophthalmologists and why it is important to know, because these patients can develop stroke, MI and can pass away. So to conclude, 
traumatic optic neuropathy is a, uh, is a clinical diagnosis. Always evaluate a life-threatening problem, globe-threatening injuries, and a brain injuries first. Surgical indication, there is no clear indication whether surgeries would work. I'll conclude in, in two minutes. Uh, consider risk benefit of steroids. There is no clear evidence-based recommendation. But most of these patients, if first 48 hours, if you give an ONTT uh, regime, probably they do well. No standard of care is established. Thank you very much. Thanks for the wonderful talk, sir. Ma'am, please. Thank you, Dr. Rashmin. That was an excellent talk. That was an excellent practical talk. Um, I think all of you um, will be taking home a few salient points from his talk. Since he has covered everything, I shall just, I, in a nutshell, cover, uh, I mean, nutshell summarize his talk, which is what um, uh, Dr. Shahid had asked me to do in the first place. So the first take home message will be, CT scan is the diagnosis of choice. This is one of the rare ophthalmologic, neuro-ophthalmological condition where you order for a CT scan instead of an MRI. Usually all neuro-ophthalmological scans will be a MRI scan with contrast, except in trauma where mostly we order for a CT scan and the MRI is a second choice only if we suspect optic nerve integrity is lost or there is a sheath hematoma or there is a keratocavernous fistula. Now, as Dr. Rashmin had suggested, is there a treatment for traumatic optic neuropathy? The answer is there is no evidence-based treatment. The, all, all the randomized clinical trial have uh, found that steroids uh, versus uh, placebo have actually, or observation, have actually not, I mean, there is no, no great benefit of using steroids. Uh, if it is a direct trauma with bone fragments, then surgical decompression, removing the fragment, removing the hematoma might help in the very early phases. However, there is actually for indirect trauma, there is actually nothing which is proved to be helpful. If at all you can give, you give intravenous methylprednisolone followed by oral steroids, or you can just observe. So it is what to give is intravenous methylprednisolone, usually one gram as Dr. Rashmin had already mentioned, no mega dose, the crash trial had to be abandoned because of the increased mortality um, uh, in the trial. So intravenous methylprednisolone, one gram per day, followed by oral taper. When to give, the ideal time is within 48 hours. You can actually give it a trial till one week, but more than 10 days it has been seen that the intravenous steroids don't help. And whom to give? Um, you can give it to everybody ideally. However, if you see an elderly patient with uh, diabetes, hypertension, the steroids will only increase the, worsen the parameters, systemic parameters. So you can actually, uh, since it has got no proven efficacy, you can withhold the steroids. And you should be cautious in giving steroids to patients with brain injury and CSF rhinorrhea. Uh, steroids, the rational will be to reduce the edema around the place, uh, around the uh, optic nerve and uh, probably save a few fibers. Important thing is to prognosticate these patients. Poor prognosticators are patients who present with NPL or just PL at, at, uh, uh, at the presentation. There is no response on VP if you do it. If there is any, uh, no visual recovery when, uh, within 48 hours, these are the patients who don't do well. So you can start with prognosticating these patients. Uh, so to summarize, uh, you can consider a course of intravenous methylprednisolone if the patient presents early. Uh, and you should actually explain the prognosis if the prognosis, if you have the poor prognostic indicators. Thank you. So the topics were extensively summarized by the two speakers. So I, I think we should ask if the audience has any questions. So uh, like, uh, 
I have a question. Yeah, uh, please. So, so suppose a patient uh, uh, presents uh, with uh, a drawn and after says three weeks of trauma. So yeah, I, I understand that there is uh, no evidence for steroids or like IVMP, but still we have to offer something. So for those cases, especially if the vision is improving, say at presentation when he says that I like his vision was like profoundly diminished, now his vision is improving, but still 636, 624 kind of thing. So do, would you still consider giving steroids in those cases or just observe? I think we can discuss with the patient the options we can give them and uh, maybe they can uh, choose as they like. We can present to them what are the pros and the cons of the steroid therapy. And we, but we definitely have to explain them. Most of, most likely the vision might not improve. So whatever the patient chooses, we can do a trial. So there are, uh, as, as he said, there are just two additional points. In your case, when you say that vision is improving, what it tells you, so there are two reasons why vision, a patient comes to you with poor vision in patient who has sustained trauma. One is there is an injury to the exons and then there is a subsequent edema as well a reactionary edema or edema because of trauma. If the vision is improving, that means the edema component is there which is going down. So as he said, maybe we can discuss with patients saying there is a role, we don't know how much it will help. Since vision is improving, maybe we can speed up that recovery and say that maybe additional oxidative stress on the retinal ganglion cell will be less. Maybe you can give steroids. Zinc supplements have been found, again there is no research to say, but it has been found to say that it, it boosts up the mitochondrial activity and maybe there can be some improvement if you give multivitamins with zinc. Yes, so you can add a multivitamin with a zinc uh, substitute, I mean with, with, uh, zinc. Uh, usually we are doing that for all the optic nerve injuries that we are seeing. Any, any like uh, comments regarding optic canal decompression? In uh, those cases, we actually, if the CT scan is showing, when we get those cuts, if uh, we see the, the patients on the first day of presentation that there is something on the report, then better to refer them to the uh, neurosurgeon or optic uh, people, those who do these kind of surgeries. So maybe that will help in the improvement rather than just pushing them with steroids. Sir, what is and the evidence, sir? Yeah, so there are, there are two points. As you very rightly said, optic canal decompression is reserved for patients who already have a bone fragment impinging on the optic nerve. There have been papers, Dr. Kasturi has been doing endoscopic decompression of the optic canal, and she has, present, uh, she has actually published in IGO a couple of papers, and she found that even though there is no bone fragment, but just by reducing, opening up a space in the optic canal by doing endoscopic way with visualization, she seemed to have patients who had three months, four months old trauma and still found some improvement in optic nerve function, vision, and even on visual fields. So a uh, larger study would be required to say that that becomes a standard of care, but it appears that probably a direct visualization and optic canal decompression might have a role to play. So yeah. uh, Dr. Shahid, one question for you. These decompressions are done by the plastic surgeons or by the neurosurgeons? Neurosurgeon, ma'am. Neurosurgeon. Neurosurgeon. Yeah. ENT as well, yeah. Hello, is there any role of injection uh, B1, B6, B12 in optic nerve injury? We, we said again, we end up giving obviously because we hope that whatever neurons which are surviving would get a boost. Uh, there is no dose schedule which can be given to say that this will work or this will not work. I end up giving initially intramuscular weekly for first four to six weeks and with oral zinc supplement followed by a prolonged at least a month or two uh, of uh, zinc supplement. How long would you wait before you give a, a news to the patient that now it's not going to improve? Generally up to six months you can still uh, have a hope to say that edema component will keep going down and patient may have some recovery for six months. But as she said, if patient presented with no PL, chances of recovery would be low. Dr. SG, as a corollary to what you said about the, you know, sp whose speciality will be doing the optic nerve fenestration, I have had the, you know, good fortune of uh, working with uh, an ENT surgeon and we have done two, three cases where we have actually gone through, you know, uh, 
approaches, which is one, a medial or orbitotomy approach, and another one through the sphenoid, the endoscopic approach. And that gives you a much bigger, you know, area of the optic nerve to defenestrate. And that actually, I personally feel, gives you the best possible result because a small nick can also close over with right. time. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So, I think that was an excellent uh, session and maybe in future, like, uh, we'll come up uh, something uh, concrete on traumatic, op traumatic optic neuropathy with research is going on. So, thanks, sir. Thanks a lot, ma'am and uh, our uh, esteemed panelists. So, our next session is on uh, management of uh, ocular uh, surface trauma, which will involve, obviously, the, uh, both the cornea and sclera. And to talk upon, uh, we have our speaker, invited speaker. Dr. Bhaskar uh, Srinivasan. Sir is a senior consultant, uh, cornea and ocular surface at Shankar Nidralia, Chennai, and has done a lot of work on uh, ocular surface, especially keratoprosthesis. Uh, the discussant for the session is Dr. Uh, Tuhin Chaudhary. He is a senior consultant, uh, cataract cornea refractive services at Disha Eye Hospital, uh, Kolkata. Uh, the panelists for the session are Dr. Uh, John Sarkar. Cornea Cataract and Refractive Services, Sushrut Eye Foundation and Research Center, Kolkata, and uh, Dr. Sayantan Bhattacharji, FACO and Refractive Surgeon, Amul Jyoti Eye Foundation, Kolkata. So I request uh, all the panelists uh, to take their seats. And uh, Basin, sir, you can start. Uh, a very good afternoon. and. Uh, Thanks for the invite. Uh, I would like to specifically thank uh, Shahid and uh, Rupak for inviting me here. So uh, I've been asked to speak on ocular surface burns, no financial interests. So basically, when you look at ocular surface burns, it's a true ophthalmic emergency, which has potentially devastating complica uh, complications that you could face, significant ocular morbidity, and most of times, it's actually the young adults or children who get affected by it. And when you look at the ultimate outcome, how well you manage the disease uh, in the acute phase goes a long way in deciding how much vision you will retain in these uh, eyes. So when you look at uh, the extent of ocular surface uh, damage, you could have a plain epithelial defect, you could have scleral ischemia, you could have corneoscleral melts, perforations. But when you look at uh, how do we grade these diseases, you're basically looking at the Ruperhol uh, grading, which looks at the haziness of the cornea and limbal ischemia. Uh, whereby uh, a lot of cases get clubbed as grade 4 uh, and grade 4 itself can have varying consequences even though they do call it as a poor prognosis you might accept, uh, actually end up with a fairly good prognosis if you are in one stage of grade 4 as compared to the others and this was actually very well demonstrated by Dua where he said that different uh, patients with grade 4 according to Rupert Hall actually behave differently and he came up with his way of classifying where he looked at the conjunctival defect and the limbal involvement. We are using the word limbal involvement because there is no way of clinically est establishing a limbal ischemia in the clinical set setting as such. Limbal ischemia basically is going to be a healing response that you will perceive and see uh, over the course of three weeks as such, or three to four weeks. But what you are seeing initially at the acute presentation is more of a limbal involvement where there is a conjunctival uh, uh, defect uh, over the limbal area along with the bulbar conjunctival defect which he uses to classify it into six grades and again gives you a prognosis where he says grade 6 is worse. But are these only the two parameters in terms of a limbal involvement uh, and a conjunctival ulceration that decides the ultimate outcome that these patients have? Uh, is laterality not a part of your problem because if you have a single eye injury you could probably rehab rehabilitate it with a limbal stem cell transplant from the other eye but as if you are dealing with a bilateral injury you are looking at an allogenic transplant or you're looking at keratoprosthesis so when you're looking at prognosis you're probably looking at laterality which has not been covered again these don't uh, take into account the intraocular pressure or the exposure so if you look at these uh, pictures these are all eyes with a grade six Dua's classification. But when you look at the panel itself, you can realize that all of these will probably end up having a different outcome based on how you approach these cases. So the same fallacy that Dua said uh, existed in Rupert Hall's classification exists even in Dua's classification, though to a minor extent. So look at this picture, both are grade 6, but obviously an eye which has a complete loss of episcleral blood vessels, which has significant hypotony, is going to behave a lot differently as compared to the eye which doesn't have this kind of a scleral ischemia. 
So when you're looking at uh, ocular injury, you're looking at the direct effect, which could be the retention of the inciting agent. It could be the epithelial defect, the intraocular pressure, the ischemia, the exposure, and inflammation, which could be either direct or secondary. And all this is what we published as the I's and E's that you need to, uh, to look at when you're managing uh, chemical injuries. And we've gone ahead one step further to kind of get some kind of a grading where we say, uh, we have labeled it as e -picks. basically standing for E is for the epithelial status, P is for the pressure, I is for the scleral ischemia, and X is for the exposure. So these are the parameters that you need to address when you look at an ocular surface burn. So let's look at uh, how we would go about removing the uh, uh, inciting agent, in, especially as far as children, as children are concerned, you might have chuna stuck up in the fornices, so you might just want to uh, Examine all children under anesthesia and then remove uh, the, the bits and pieces which are there. If it's only in the fornix, it's easier. But if it is stuck into the sclera and into the cornea, you will have to surgically remove the uh, chunk of uh, lime. And otherwise, the eye is not going to quieten. And this patient over a period of time actually did well in spite of the severity of injury. Again, if you're looking at an epithelial defect, you're looking at the extent of defect. So whether it's only corneal, whether it's conjunctival. Again, if conjunctival, how large is the conjunctival ulceration? If it's small, you might just get away with the bandage lens and topical steroids. But if it is larger, you might need an amniotic membrane. But if it's significantly large, like a grade 5 or a grade 6 to us classification, you would probably want to combine it with some source of allogenic epithelial cells, which we, call, which we uh, use the alloslet and which we have been using for the last almost about uh, eight years with fairly good results. So this was a patient with a, with a grade 6 injury with a lime plaque stuck, which we removed. We did a patch graft in that area and we combined it with, with an allogenic slit in the acute phase. And subsequently, the patient underwent an autogenic slit and has re, uh, regained about 6-9 vision in that eye. Another patient with a severe uh, ocular surface damage with a complete deepithelization of the surface with uh, an allogenic slit followed by an autogenic slit maintaining 6-9 vision at 3 years. The next component is scleral ischemia. So obviously when you look at this image, there's a focal uh, ischemia which could probably be observed. But when it's much more diffuse, you need to get vasculature to these areas. So you will need to go to the fornix, dissect the vascular tenons and try to mobilize it and suture it close to the limbus to act as a source of vascularization. And this is... Uh, yeah, this is what has been described by Ryan et al. in 1970s, uh, 1990s. And basically it involves uh, digging deep into the fornix to get your vascular pedicle. You would want to pull it up with relaxing incisions so that your fornices don't get shallow as a consequence of this. And uh, you will normally suture it with uh, vicral sutures close to the limbus and you can use fibrin glue also as an additional to reduce the number of sutures that you need to place. So this basically is a video where there is a grade 6 burn, the complete uh, surface is deepithelized. You can see that when I'm cutting the tenons, there is not much of bleeding. We are going to the fornix, relaxing the uh, tenons, mobilizing it, suturing it to the surface. Since this also had almost a tar complete tarsal uh, conjunctival epithelial defect, we ended up draping the entire ocular surface with uh, the amniotic membrane and then used uh, uh, allogenic slit to epithelize the surface. And uh, we were able to retain vision in one of his eye and he has about 636 vision in that eye. If he had not done that, he would have probably required keratoprosthesis as such. The next thing is, Im is important is the exposure. So obviously if an eye, eye which is having so much of secretory electropion and is left to heal by itself is going to end up with perforation, which we do not want. So if there is significant exposure, you will need to get the help of your oculoplasty colleagues, do a, a skin graft, do a tarsorophy, do whatever you can to cover the eyes and protect the eyes from ending up with, an, with a perforation. The moment you end up with a corneal perforation, your battle is almost lost. So we've looked at these parameters and we've tried to get something called as uh, an EPIX grade generator, which is freely available online in the Oculus Surface portal. So you can put in your uh, patient details and it, we have classified it, the limbal deficiency based on Duvas classification. There is no change in that. But we have added on the other parameters in terms of pressure, ischemia, uh, exposure. And the, and the defect in terms of the surface defect, we have clubbed the limbal as based on Duvas classification. The conjunctiva, we have graded it as no involvement, less than 25%, less than 50%, less than 75%, and 100%. And the corneal involvement is less than 50% or more than 50%. And tarsal involvement, whether it is less than 50%, whether it's in one eye, eyelid, it's in both the eyelids or in both the eyes. So we've kind of graded it in this manner. So this helps us look at all these parameters when we are uh, assessing a patient with chemical uh, injury. So again, the pressure, whether it is low, whether it is high, uh, and in terms of ischemia, whether it is mild, moderate, severe, or very severe, and the exposure, whether there is no exposure, mild exposure, moderate, or severe exposure. 
So you enter the data, it's all in a drop down menu, you can enter the data and once you enter the relevant data, it generates a code. It tells you whether it is bilateral or it's unilateral. It tells you the agent. It tells you the date of presentation because obviously a, a, a grade, uh, whatever is the grade that you're getting at day one uh, and a, the grade that you're getting at day two, uh, at day, uh, day 10 is going to be different because if it's a grade six at grade uh, at day one, it probably is different. Whereas it's a grade six at two weeks or three weeks means it was probably even worse to begin with and uh, you will have to prognos prognosticate the patient accordingly. The grade and the prognosis at this point of time, we have kept it based on the uh, Duas classification itself because we are populating our own data to then kind of give a better uh, uh, value in terms of prognosis for these uh, patients. And uh, it kind of uh, gives you uh, an endpoint to look for. Your treatment is basically going to be looking at all these parameters, E, P, I, X, and your endpoint is to reach E0, P0, I0, and X0. And once you reach there, the acute phase treatment is done. I'll just take a couple of minutes. And based on this, we had already published our algorithm in terms of managing of uh, I's and E's, where we had said for ischemia, which is localized or it is generalized, you might want to consider either observation or tenanplasty, where it's exposure, you might want to consider tarsography or a skin graft. So we've kind of put now a value for all of us to kind of know, okay, if it is uh, I1, you're probably going to observe. If it is I2, 3 or 4, you're probably going to go ahead and do a tenanplasty. Again, if it is X2 or X3 for exposure, you will have to take the steps in terms of doing either a tarsography or a skin graft as such. Uh, for pressure, yes, we do know whether it is low or high. We need to start the patient on systemic steroids if it is low and we need to start them on AGM if it is high. The most important part of this is going to be the epithelial defect on the surface. So where you're looking at a pure corneal defect, if it is less than 50%, then you're probably just putting a contact lens and uh, observing the patient. If it is more than 50%, you'd probably go ahead with an amniotic membrane. And if it's a conjunctival defect, you're again looking at whether it is C1 or it is C2, 3 or 4, whereby you would probably take a call on uh, going ahead with a surgical intervention in terms of uh, uh, amniotic membrane or allogenic slit, as the case may be. The idea of this uh, presentation is basically for you to know that you have to observe the patient till the conjunctival defect heals, till the corneal epithelial defect heals, till the exposure settles. So your end point of your treatment in an acute chemical injury is to reach E0, P0, I0, X0. And this basically is a dated and time document which is dynamic because you need to analyze the patient every second day and if any of your parameter is getting worse, you can probably take the next step in terms of surgically intervening if things are not going according to what you would want it to do. Uh, it helps avoid unnecessary complications that we would have otherwise if you don't look at the exposure, if we don't look at the intraocular pressure, we don't look at the ischemia as such. So it's integrally described and conceptualized. It gives you a comprehensive approach. It's very user friendly and it's free to use uh, if you can log into the Oculus Surface portal. We, we can manage some of these patients who have not been managed appropriately in the acute phase with keratoprosthesis. But having said that, we would prefer that we don't reach this endpoint and we are able to manage these patients much better in the acute phase. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, at the outset, my sincere thanks to OSWB for this opportunity. So I will be just summarizing everything he has already covered. So. This ocular trauma is a condition, only condition where history taking is not so much important and you just jump to this treatment only without considering this, without assessing the injury, all those things. So the primary goal is this globe preservation and ocular surface maintenance. And if it is maintained, that is this epithelium is healed up, then we can think about future reconstruction and visual rehabilitation. So to summarize this medical management like that, topical antibiotics till the epithelial defects heal. Topical corticosteroids, so you have to use either dexamethasone or prednisolone acetate, no lutepridinol, anything like that. So it can be as per severity, you have to use it one to two hourly. TR substitutes, topical cycloplegics and beta blockers, topical potassium ascorbate and vitamin C, oral doxycycline, acetazolamide and ascorbate also can be used. So for surgical therapy, amniotic membrane transplantation is the treatment of choice in grade, more than grade 3 injury as per the classification. If you don't have this amniotic membrane, then you can go for this large diameter bandage contact lens like 16 millimeter or 18 millimeter. In some cases, we have to go for tenon plasty or congenital transplantation. 
So tenonoplasty, as you mentioned, that it is uh, used in cases where there is limbal ischemia. So you can see that there is ischemia here. So here we have to take this tenon from the fornicial area and then you have to study it at this area, at the limbus, by using 7 0 -fikrel. Sometimes you have to modify the procedure. Suppose this is the case where uh, you cannot uh, take this conjunctiva because it is short tissue. So you have to put a magnetic membrane here and then take this tenons graft from these two opposite sides and then put it and then suture it by 7 0 -fikrel. So this is the man who had this tenonplasty and uh, this patient, this is the, after 10 days, you can see that the amnetic membrane is getting disintegrated and this is the picture after three weeks. And then after six weeks, patients developed this large epithelial defect. Here comes the role of uh, autologous serum. And it is quite helpful. It is having transforming growth, growth factor beta, which controls epithelial proliferation and to maintain cells in undifferentiated state. So that patient who had this epithelial defect, now this patient got this better, this epithelial, it is better. Limbal is getting better after one month. This is the picture. And after six months, this epithelium is healed up. And now I thought that to go for uh, uh, keratoplasty, but lockdown came and patient was on this only topical lubricants. Patient after came after two years with, with PLPR2 patient now 624. So long-term damage which causes chronic inflammation often causes fibrosis and continues to cause damage to the conjunctival and limbal stem cells that leads to limbal stem cell deficiency. And in unilateral or bilateral cases, there can be slate or clate, all those things. And so to summarize, these patients need close follow-ups and after the procedure for management of possible sequelae. So proper management in the acute stage is most important, otherwise you have to go for this management of sequelae. Coronary scarring with limbus stem deficiency is a common sequelae. These patients may develop secondary epineurial glaucoma, conjunctival scarring with simbleferon, dry eye, and exposure due to lead malposition and from cicatricial changes. So to conclude, management in the acute stage is that determines the long-term outcome. Judicious, deci judicious decision is needed to have long-term favorable outcome. As per the laterality, we have many options and these patients need lifelong follow-up. Thank you. So, uh, excellent presentations from both the speakers and discussants. I think uh, both have talked uh, extensively about ocular surface uh, injuries, more so about chemical injuries. So, just for the interest of the audience, I'd like uh, Dr. Sayantan to just uh, briefly give few tips about uh, how to go for a corneal uh, rupture repair. Uh, for a corneal rupture, first you'll have to evaluate uh, whether the rupture is extending, uh, how far is it? Is it a small, uh, very small size, tiny size, which is not coming into the pupillary plane? Recently, I had a patient uh, wherein the patient had come after some spring uh, action, uh, rubber band kind of uh, hurting the cornea, but uh, the rupture was uh, kind of two to three millimeter uh, laceration which was self-sealed and uh, the uh, anterior chamber was well formed and uh, on a force seedal test I found that there was no significant leak of the dye and since it was well formed I asked the patient to uh, stay uh, in the hospital admitted and uh, then observed after uh, 24 hours still it was doing well there was no uh, active leak or anything like that no globe collapse uh, so I waited for another 24, 48 hours and thereafter uh, with conservative therapy, without any repair, without suturing, uh, gradually the patient uh, responded well and there was no need to suture. So it depends many a times on how it presents, whether uh, uh, edges of the rupture are well opposed, whether they are irregular, whether there is a significant leak. If there is a large leak and most of the time when it is uh, the sclera is involved, I would go in for an immediate repair depending on that. And uh, I have found that if uh, the tear is not extending into the visual axis, if we wait, the visual outcome is far better compared to directly going in for a repair. If I could just add, uh, yes. when you're looking at a corneal uh, tear, corne corneal tear or a, a scleral tear, it's also important to know the depth of your uh, tear. So if it's a corneal tear, sometimes if it's a if it's a lacer. 
if it's uh, say a self-sealed laceration or it is only a partial thickness, the tendency is to probably not suture. The only thing is if your depth of your scar is more than half of your corneal thickness, it is ultimately going to result in an irregular astigmatism uh, which will become difficult for you to manage. Taking one or two sutures, uh, even if it involves taking the patient into the OR at that point of time, actually will end up giving you a much better uh, uh, visual results at the end. Um, so, looking at CDLs, yes, is important uh, to know whether it's full thickness or partial thickness, but looking at the depth of your uh, uh, cut, if you cannot make it out clinically, you can get an OCT done to, to look at your depth of your lesion and then plan your uh, surgical thing, especially if it's a uh, partial thickness uh, laceration. Because yes, putting a contact lens, it will heal. But uh, six months down the line, one year down the line, you'll have an irregular astigmatism which becomes difficult to handle. Sir, just two things. Uh, stillate, uh, stillate tears. So sometimes when, uh, when we uh, like suture the arms, all the three arms we have sutured, there's a leak, central leak. So uh, do we have a role of glue there? Do we put a glue BCL there? Yes. Or we have to put uh, sutures also? Like, so you have various area. techniques of uh, suturing the scleral uh, uh, a stellate tear whereby you can take it uh, something like a mattress suture across the incision. But if at some point you feel that uh, you have taken your sutures and it is still uh, leaking from the center, you put in an air bubble in the anterior chamber, dry the, the apex and you just need, you are not going to be spraying the glue over the entire surface. You just need, just dip, take, take your 30, 30 gauge needle or 27 gauge needle, dip it into the cyanoacrylate glue and just place it at the tip of your uh, leak and that should be uh, sufficient as such. Uh, and then you place a contact lens on top because that will, uh, otherwise the glue will get dislodged and it will cause more discomfort to the patient. So the only few things here, all your sutures with 10-0 should be buried, even if it is 10-0, it has to be buried, otherwise the patient is going to be uncomfortable. And uh, you take a mattress uh, suture or a star-shaped suture in a stellate tear uh, to, to see you can seal the central opening. If it is not sealing, then uh, you want to take uh, a very, uh, just a small one drop of glue at that uh, area. All the other suturing techniques for a corneal tear are like in principle, you have to have it per, uh, perpendicular to your incision size. You would be suturing your lim landmarks first. So if you have a corneal scleral tear, you will suture the limbus first to get your uh, landmark. Your uh, viscoelastic that you are going to enter is not from the incision, it's going to be through a separate side port that you would create. Any iris tissue which has been outside the wound for more than six hours, you would be a little bit careful to push it back in. It, if you feel there's a doubt, it might make sense to actually uh, excise the iris, uh, iris tissue as such. If there is floculent lens matter or cataract uh, along with it, you would want to uh, aspirate it. I don't prefer putting in a lens in that setting because you are not sure about infection, you are not sure about your IOL calculation. So I would just do a lens aspiration, close the wound and then after two weeks or three weeks, uh, take a call uh, and if my uh, astigmatism at a month's time with the sutures on is not much, I might go in and, and do a lens earlier also if it's a pediatric patient. If it's an adult patient, I can wait for two, two to three months, wait for the scar to mature, remove the sutures, then plan uh, a cataract surgery with an IOL in which case if I can regularize the corneal topography with laser, I can even put in a toric uh, lens at that point of time. Uh, Dr. John, uh, somebody had asked about deep stromal foreign body in the previous session. So, what to, like how to go about deep stromal foreign bodies? Should we remove them? No, regarding the deep stromal uh, foreign body, this, uh, I think if you have a facility for the ASOCT, first to do the ASOCT. You exactly know which level you are dealing with. Number one. Number two, should not be trying the OPD in the street lamp. It should be under the your uh, operating microscope. And if it is very deep, sometimes we have I mean, presented or uh, published one of the cases. We do the simply the lamellar dissection of the things, remove the foreign body, and it's just sitting over the DM. It's a, someone is working the grinding, so the foreign body is embedded over the dust on the DM. So if you try to remove it off, you may perforate the DM or it may lodge in the AC. So remove is just 5 mm punch over it, we remove the lamellar dissection, I remove the foreign body and thus uh, do a lamellar, I mean, LK. So, if you have the facilities, the key note is that if you have the ASOCT, do the ASOCT, you will be in the direct, exactly in the which direction you are doing, you should be doing it. And uh, regarding the ocular surface burn, uh, just I want to uh, uh, take the opportunity, Basin sir is my teacher, so 10 years back, sir. so we are doing the fellowship under sir, he is a pan cornea person. Sir, regarding um, uh, all of, some of us are doing the, uh, the ocular surface reconstruction, 
So can you please highlight, sir, regarding the post of uh, immunomodulator? Specifically, whatever you were showing this thing, if you clubbed up with the allocelate, the prognosis is definitely to some extent bad. But we need some of the immunomodulation. So what exactly should we do? Only steroid if we do the first sitting the immunomodulator or is it cyclosporin or any other things? So I'll just finish a bit about the uh, deep stromal foreign body. You first need to know what is the type of foreign body. If it's a blast, uh, blast material and you have an inert uh, sulfur granules which, are, which the patient is otherwise not uh, symptomatic about, you don't need to go in and dig and try to remove the foreign body. If it's something which you feel has to be removed, it could be glass, it co uh, glass also, theoretically because it's inert, you could probably leave it. But if it is something which is metallic, you would definitely want to go ahead and do it. Glass, if, uh, if it's large enough, you would want to do it. There, you would go ahead with a, like a trapdoor. You make a, a partial thickness corneal, corneal incision. You reach the depth of your thing based on your uh, uh, OCT. You can take guarded uh, knives, 300 microns, 400 microns, so that you reach that particular level. Lift it like a trapdoor, remove the, remove the piece and put the, put the thing back. And that could be stuck with glue or take, just take a, take a couple of sutures to keep the anatomy uh, safe. As far as uh, the chemical injury and immunosuppression is concerned, when you're talking of an acute chemical injury, uh, we are not really worried about immunosuppression because the role of allogenic slit uh, in that point of time is just to get the epithelium on. Uh, we, do not, we do not expect the epithelium to survive, but it is just through for the inflammation to settle down. Once the eye quietens, if it is a unilateral injury, you always have the option of doing an autogenic slit six months down the line. The idea of allogenic slit is to prevent the cornea from ending up with uh, melt or perforation. If it is a bilateral injury, then yes, you can give patient uh, systemic immunosuppression. But if it's a bilateral injury with a lot of skin burns, I would I would normally wait a couple of weeks because I uh, you, you can also end up having uh, skin infections of the skin graft and things like that. So generally, we don't give an, uh, systemic immunosuppression for an acute uh, chemical burn uh, patient that we are doing in all allogenic slit. We wait after about two weeks, once we are sure that the skin has also started healing, there is no focus of infection, the cornea is epithelized and then we want it to survive, then we can give either a systemic, uh, uh, along with systemic steroids, you could add on mycophenolate uh, or uh, cyclosporin or tacrolimus as such. But that's for only from a bilateral injury point of view. If it's unilateral, you really don't need it. The only role of allogenic slit is to facilitate epithelization, reduce the number of times that you need to do an amniotic to get the epithelium of the cornea uh, healed. And once that is done, six months down the line, eye is quiet, do an autogenic conjunctival limbal auto, uh, autograft or a slit and visually rehabilitate the, uh, the patient as such. The other thing is, as ophthalmologists, we are wary to take the patient up into the OR again and again, uh, especially in a chemical injury multiple times you have to take the patient up for amniotics. Think of the burn surgeons. They take the patient up 20, 30 times into the OR to touch up their burn surgeries. So it's not that there is a deficiency on your side. The, disease, the impact of the injury is such that you will have to take the patients up for multiple interventions to be able to anatomically salvage the eye and then live along to give them vision in that eye. Okay, Any thank rule you, sir. Of, sir yeah, excellent IBMP. discussion. In the interest of time, like I, well, uh, one question, uh, I, have, uh, I, I have, I have the audience question. to have the questions. The sulfur particles embedded after crack eye injury, will you try to remove the deep stromal particles or leave no. it as a? Not much, sir. Unless some of them tend to have a severe photophobia. If they have a severe photophobia, I would probably do it like an anterior lamellar keratoplasty which will remove off the bulk of the pieces. Because these particles would be at multiple levels, at multiple points. You cannot physically go and remove each and every uh, particle. The uh, only way for the central graft would be to do a PK, but you don't really need a PK. So I would go ahead and do an anterior lamellar if the depth, if the, if the deposits are more concentrated in the superficial area, you can do uh, uh, just an anterior 200 microns or 250 microns anterior lamellar keratoplasty to kind of reduce the uh, load of uh, the particles as such. Okay, thanks. That thanks. all is are inert, sir. So mostly bone blast injury, whatever we had, so we don't touch the things if it is deep inert mode. Thank you thanks very much, Dr. Shahid. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Our outstation fac uh, no, faculties have to leave, so we need to wrap up the session. So uh, actually, uh, we are just concluding it and till now we have been talking about the eye which is injured without thinking that something else, something can happen to the other eye also. So yeah, we are talking about sympathetic ophthalmitis and to talk upon that, uh, we have uh, our speaker Dr. Amitabh Kumar who is a senior consultant.
कैटरैक्ट एंड यूवीएस सब इसी तरह शंकर नेत्रालय कोलकाता द डिस्कशन फॉर द सेशन इज डॉक्टर अनिंदो किशोर मजुमदार हु इज अटैच टू नेत्रालयम कोलकाता एंड द पैनलिस्ट फॉर द सेशन इज डॉक्टर देवाशीष दास ऑनरेरी सेक्रेटरी ऑफ सलमी सोसाइटी ऑफ वेस्ट बेंगाल सो आई रिक्वेस्ट द पैनलिस्ट एंड द डिस्कशन टू टेक द चेयर ऑन द डाइस प्लीज Good afternoon. At the very outset, I would like to thank OSWB and Dr. Rajesh for this invite. And as uh, Dr. Uh, Shahid Alam said, that uh, all this morning we have been talking about the injured eye. So I would request you to shift focus and revert your attention to the contralateral eye as well, because at times the other eye might need to be taken care of. So yes, I would be speaking on sympathetic ophthalmia, and I have no financial interest in my presentation. So let me start with a case. I had a 13-year-old girl from West Bengal who came to me with complaints of decreased vision in her right eye for 15 days. She had a history of open globe injury in the left eye a month back, for which a corneal tear suturing was done elsewhere. She had been diagnosed as a case of sympathetic ophthalmia, and what was on a suboptimal dose of oral steroids and azathioprine. So at presentation, her best corrected visual acuity was counting fingers close to face in the right eye and hand movement in the left eye, with normal intraocular pressures, a panuveitis in the right eye, with disc hyperemia and an exudative RD. The left eye had corneal sutures and early cataract and an exudative RD in the other eye as well. So this was the left eye. You can see those uh, sutures in place uh, for the corneal tear. And this was the right eye where you can see those keratic precipitates and ovitreous cells. The fundus at this visit had a disc hyperemia, an exudative retinal detachment, and multiple pockets of subretinal fluid. We went ahead with an ultrasound B scan, which revealed an exudative RD in the right eye and a peripapillary coronal thickness of 1.78 millimeters. The left eye had an RD with a PPCT of 1.26 millimeter. So the diagnosis was pretty clear. We were dealing with sympathetic ophthalmia, so we went ahead with. Uh, prednisolone acetate eye drops along with cycloplegics and after a physician's and a pediatrician's clearance we put the patient on 500 milligrams per day of IVMP for three days followed by a taping dose of oral steroids in the form of tablet prednisolone 50 milligrams per day along with calcium supplementation and antacids and we continued her immunosuppressive therapy in the form of tablet azathioprine 50 milligram twice a day. So in a month's time, her vision in the right eye improved to 6, 9, and 6. Both the eyes became quiet, and this is in a month's time. So she was on an irregular follow-up, and she had a reactivation four months from presentation, and again, a panuveitis in the right eye. And here you can see the media has become a bit hazy because of arthritis, and the disc looks hyperemic as well. And this was the angiography at this time, which showed some inflammation in the back part of the eye. So we hiked up the topical steroids and the oral steroids and continued her own tablet azathioprine. She came back to baseline at three months. And this is her fundus. You can see some RP alterations and some pigment clumps. Again, a second reactivation because she had stopped her treatment so her vision dropped to 624 N10 in the right eye with a, a, a fresh attack of panuveitis in the right eye. And this was a fundus at the right, in, in the right eye at this visit. So we again put the patient on steroids, oral and topical, along with immunosuppressive therapy. And in, in a month's time, she came back to 69N6 and the eye quietened. To, to sum up, a case of sympathetic ophthalmia who, ha, who was treated had an, a reactivation, in fact, two reactivations because of irregular follow-up and non-compliance. And as after the second reactivation, she stabilized with medication. So the take-home message is these patients need an early diagnosis of very aggressive treatment. You need to hit them early and hit them hard. Appropriate medications and dosage for adequate duration, and they need a very long-term follow-up. So the Present classification for sympathetic ophthalmia says that if you have, there's no history of uveitis in one eye and you have had an injury in the other eye, be it open globe or closed globe, and you've ruled out syphilis and sarcoidosis, this is a sympathetic ophthalmia. If the, posterior, if, if the choroid is involved, then it is a most severe form. So a meta-analysis of 24 population-based studies of sympathetic ophthalmia after open globe injury put the incidence at 0.19%. So 
So I'm not going into the details of the pathophysiology, but there's an immune mechanism, and you know there, there is an upregulation of some uh, you know, pro inflammatory proteins, which lead to an oxidative stress of the photoreceptor loss. So mainly trauma and iatrogenic in the form of surgeries. So a, a study was conducted at uh, Shankar Nitralia Chennai, and they found that males, it was more common in males, trauma being the commonest cause. All of them were treated with steroids and immunosuppressives, and the commonest complications were cataract and secondary um, and ocular hypertension. So not only open globe injuries, but closed globe injuries can also cause sympathetic ophthalmia, and there are reports of disinsertion of iris, a hyphema because of a non-penetrating trauma leading to sympathetic ophthalmia. In some countries, uh, ocular surgery has overtaken trauma as the most common cause uh, of sympathetic ophthalmia. And uh, amongst surgeries, posterior segment surgeries have been indicted to be one of the common causes, followed by cataract surgery. And even small gauge VR surgeries, as small as 27 gauge, also can lead lead to sympathetic ophthalmia. So the earliest presentation of SO has been as early as five days and it can be as late as 45 years from the initial injury. So imaging plays a very important role in diagnosis which could be non-invasive or invasive and non-invasive in the form of OCT or OCTA or ultrasonography and invasive ones in the form of fluorescent angiography and ICGA where fluorescent angiography will see a uh, disc involvement with pinpoint leaks and late pooling and ICG will show hypocyanescent spots corresponding to the uh, pinpoint leaks in, on in geography. So there are some uncommon presentations of uh, sympathetic ophthalmia with a frosted branch angiitis. There's something called a posterior sympathetic ophthalmia which has been published by the PGI group where they have found only fundus changes and no anterior segment involvement. So the treatment is basically corticosteroids, whether intravenous or oral, topical, and immunomodulatory therapy. So we have a whole gamut of immunosuppressives available for treating sympathetic ophthalmia. And with this treatment, there, is, there are reports of long-term drug-free remission and in sympathetic ophthalmia. Chlorambucil, though very toxic, still they have found a high-dose short-term chlorambucil therapy to be having a low rate of recurrence and minimal long-term serious health consequences. There are reports of intravitreal steroids, either as uh, triamcine alone or fluocene alone, acetonide or, or, or dexamethasone implant for treating sympathetic ophthalmia. So now I'm wading into troubled waters, so whether to enucleate or eviscerate or not do anything, so it's very controversial. So if the exciting eye has got a visual potential and you're able to salvage the eye, I think None of these, these is in, uh, are required. But if it's a non-salvageable eye, if there's no visual potential, or you're, it's inoperable, then it, uh, in, it should be done as soon as possible, or at least within two weeks. Now, whether enucleation or evisceration, so enucleation has got a cosmetic disadvantage, and theoretically, there are lesser chances of SA because you're not leaving behind any uveal pigments, but the rate of SA is around 03 to 0.9%. For evisceration, it, it has a cosmetic advantage, but theoretically there are more chances of uh, SO. But reports say that uh, the chances of uh, SO after uh, evisceration is, uh, is less, so it's an effective and safe procedure. The complications are mainly uh, intraocular inflammation and their sequelae and cataract. So I thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Sarah has already covered all the points in the discussion. I am just summing a few points. Uh, it's a bilateral situation. It's a bilateral granulomatous uveitis. When you are looking for a uveitis happening, especially in this scenario, many of the times we do not see the uh, traumatized eye or the surgery or the eye of concern. It's a bilateral situation and evidence of granulomatous inflammation is very, very important clinical finding. And it typically occurs after surgery and any trauma to the eye. Open globe injuries are more described in the literature, even closed globe injuries and severe burn injuries are associated with sympathetic ophthalmitis. And during, in surgeries, retinal detachment repair 
passed on a vitrectomy, why these uh, surgeries are uh, more with the incidence of sympathetic ophthalmitis, I will come later. Any cyclodestructive procedures, any complicated cataract surgery, iridectomy, paracentesis, intravitreal injections, even plug bachytherapy and post-TV sedation, the sympathetic ophthalmitis are described. Even in literature, acanthamoeba keratitis are also described with case reports of sympathetic ophthalmitis. So it's always a clinical suspicion. It's, it's the diagnosis is always, always clinical. Any reaction in the normal eye, may it be an anterior segment reaction or an unexplained VIT reaction. Or according to the severity, it, it could be a retinal, exudative retinal detachment. It could be inflammatory vasculopathy in the form of perivasculitis. The choroid could be gross leak in the thick end in ultrasound. In very severe cases, it can give rise to even T sign. When you do an angiography, there is a typical finding of sparing of the chorio capillaries. It distinguishes with another entities of pan uveitis, like VKH. And delin Fuchs nodules are aggregations of lymphocytes, which are clinically demonstrable as well as with the fundus angiography. So, coming to a pathogenesis, why this uh, mainly the posterior segment kidney surgeries or a open globe injuries are responsible for more occurrence with sympathetic ophthalmitis. Before coming to this, there is a natural preventive mechanism which is known as ACADES, which is active in our eye, which prevents occurrence of unnecessary inflammation inside the eye. It happens because the eye is relatively lacks the lymphatic into drainage. The conjunctiva is the main source of lymphatic drainage in the eye. So, until and unless it is exposed to the immune system, it will not, the immune system not getting activated that much. That's why all the inflammatory situations in the eye doesn't get reflected in the body and the vice versa. All the inflammatory situations in the body doesn't get reflected in the eye. And there is predominance of suppressed T cells. In case of a trauma or a posterior segment in the surgery, there is this exposure of the uveo retinal antigens. Some of the antigens we known as ACE antigens. These are known as cryptic antigens or these are known as sequestered antigens. Those are hidden inside few of the tissue cells like one of them is eye. They are getting exposed to the conjunctival lymphatics. They sensitize the system. And then there is uncontrolled diffuse non-necrotizing granulomatous inflammation involving the choroid and giving rise to sympathetic ophthalmitis. The management as is very nicely uh, described, it is an ocular emergency. So call um, pulse corticosteroid followed by high dose in the steroid. Early uh, initiation of the immunosuppressive therapy and immunosuppressive therapy combination in maintenance is very, very important. Monoclonal antibody is very important in case of very recurrence because this as sir has already depicted that oxidative injuries with anti-TNF and interleukins are mo solely responsible for the relapse. So monoclonal antibodies have significant role in treatment part and surgical inoculation is controversial. So failure of a therapy depending upon either a diagnostic glioma or a compliance of the drugs because it is a very long term therapy very poor in the follow-up and inadequate dosage. That is also very important. We, we diagnose the disease, but many of the time the dosage of the immunosuppressive are not very adequate or the duration. So prognosis is multifactorial and it's a very critical balance. It's known to be a very relapsing disease. When you're looking at the relapse to reduce, we have to increase the drugs. We have to combine the many of the immunosuppressives. That results in drug to toxicity. So it's a very critical balance. So proper dosage and maintenance of chemotherapy, long-term follow-up, and complication management, early referral and expert opinion. Thank you. My sincere acknowledgement to OSWB and Dr. Rajesh Majumdar Chaudhary, sir. Thank you. Uh, as uh, Dr. Didi goes, can I ask a couple of quick questions? Are there any uh, early symptoms before the full-blown picture in the sympathizing eye? which tells you that this guy, this eye is going into uh, sympathetic ophthalmia, early features. And the second one is, are there any protective features? I mean, I, I know there used to be uh, dictum that if the exciting eye had infection while there was a trauma or surgery, then probably the other eye, it's a preventive factor against SO. Yeah, for your first, uh, 
As far as the pr protective thing is concerned, I, uh, I think uh, uh, what actually happens in sympathetic ophthalmia is sometimes you may land up uh, with the exciting high having a better vision as compared to the other eye. But since uh, now uh, various, uh, I mean, much better treatment options are available with us. Um, so uh, I think, I, I don't really feel there is any uh, prevention of, because that again is controversial, but doing an enucleation or an evisceration, if that reduces the chances of SO, that has not really been proved. And I forgot the first one, sir. The early feature before the full blown. Yeah, so theoretically, lack of accommodation. And whenever you have an, uh, an injury in one eye and you're examining the other eye, be very careful in examining the anterior chamber and also the, uh, the posterior chamber, especially the uh, anterior vitreous cells. They say that they are the first to appear. So um, may, not, may not be there in the first visit itself. So you should prime the patient that any problem happening in the other eye, they, they should report to you immediately. But there's a very high chance of, because the, the duration of presentation could be even four decades after the initial injury. So um, the early signs are mainly symptom is lack of accommodation and the sign is vit uh, vitreous cells in the anterior vitreous phase. I think so. I think I um, echo with Amitav. The basic earliest sign will be the lack of accommodation. Patient will not be able to see the near vision. The distant vision will be clearer. And as far as the slit lamp findings, the, there will be AC, mild AP, 1 plus or KP's initial stages in the other eye. And where there is a history of a trauma in the other eye. So these are the basic initial symptoms. In your presentation, you told that even the sympathetic ophthalmitis may happen after 45 years. So, how do you diagnose that this is the particular case is sympathetic ophthalmia or nothing else other than uveitis? Uh, so, how, how do you stamp that? Yeah. So, something very similar to sympathetic ophthalmia is VKH. The only difference is a history of injury. Because the presentation, the imaging uh, features, everything is, will be the same as uh, sympathetic ophthalmia. So you may have, I've had patients who have had a history of VKH and then they have come with uh, an injury in one eye and have thrown up an inflammation in the other eye. Because even VKH, uh, you have a slightest amount of injury can cause a reactivation. So very difficult to uh, differentiate uh, between the two. The only uh, uh, thing which can differentiate between SO and VKH is the history of injury, but fortunately this treatment remains the same for both the entities. So that's the breather. So for the delayed cases, we will have these uh, dalinfix nodules in the periphery with, along with an associated history of injury. Uh, Even VKH after will have the same features. Sir. Yeah. DF nodules uh, can be there the in VKH injury, as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but in, in, in our part of the world, the commonest VKH is a probable VKH where you do not have any other signs. No skin signs, no CNS signs, nothing. And complete VKH is at rarest. Sorry? In my sir, please. Harada, yeah. Harada is, a possi is, is, is possible. So by def definition, it is bilateral, but we have had um, almost around out of, uh, we, uh, we, have, uh, we are presenting a case of almost around 500 cases of VKH but Harada's has been a very small segment of that. And it could also be unilateral, though by definition it is bilateral, but you could still have a unilateral presentation. Very basic question. So, in earlier days it was taught that incarceration of iris or uveal tissue in the primary eye was a cause of the sympathetic ophthalmitis in the secondary eye. So how this message stands at present? I think the basic pathology remains the same, sir. So that's the reason they say that if you do, if you enucleate the eye, you're not leaving behind any uveal pigment. So the chances of, theoretically, the chances of SO is less. If you do evisceration, you might leave behind some uveal tissue because it would be very difficult to very, to meticulously remove all the uveal tissue. You wouldn't know that. But even with evisceration, the chances of um, SO developing is pretty low. But the only thing is, at the first instance when the patient is presented to you, if there's any visual potential and you're able to, op uh, to salvage the eye somehow, 
better not to either eviscerate or enucleate the exciting eye because we have had patients where the exciting eye has had the only ambulatory vision. So basically to summarize the entire UVIT session today, number one, if I give a point wise, number one, near vision is often affected before the distance vision for the patient. The most common ocular surgery is the vitroretinal surgery which leads to sympathetic ophthalmitis of the other eye. Usual presentation is between four to eight weeks, but the range is between five days to 66 years as per the literature. And, but the 90% of these cases develops within one year of the injury. Mostly these are bilateral severe AC reactions with the mutton fat KPs. It is asymmetric and occasionally more in the sympathetic eye. The earliest sign as mentioned is the loss of accommodation or a mild AC reaction or a posterior vitreous cells as Amitabh mentioned in the uninjured eye. Basic workup is to rule out the differential diagnosis which remains VKH, FICO anaphylaxis, sarcoid, syphilis and tuberculosis. And the basic prevention though enucleation is not a modality of choice right now, but if it is an unsalvageable eye, enucleate within 14 days. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, great discussion and great take home messages here. Thank you all. So we move on to the next uh, session. Our next speaker on medical legal aspects is Dr. Abhijit Ghosh, yes. a consultant at Nightingale Hospital and Norobindo Netralaya. He is a vitroretinal specialist with nearly 50 publications to his credit. Abhijit Dha has been the president of OSWB and ISOC and is presently, uh, he heads the organizing committee for AIOC 2024. Abhijit please. Good afternoon. Outside, I thank Rajesh for bringing me out of wilderness. Thank you, Rajesh. This podium of OSWB is part of our heart. For three decades, we have been associated with it, so I'm sorry I can't thank you for it. So speaking on a subject of Avoiding medical pitfalls, you know, half the people have gone. I always compare speaking of medical legal to the air hostess speaking before the plane goes. Put your oxygen mask, we don't, we are reading other things. When you, <laughs> when you water evacuation, what you do, we never listen. But when one court case comes, you all forget all what you are speaking for the whole day. And you go up to the lawyer. That is the, our destiny. I think you will all believe this. So one, one simple letter from the court will spoil all your work. And you'll see that why have I, and the next question you ask, why have I done that? Why haven't taken that case? And there's no friends, no chandeliers, no nothing, a board courtroom, and you go every evening after your day and give hundreds of papers and hundreds of things. So there we are. But at the end of the day, friends, I want to say something which is very important also. So there are three categories of doctors I find out. One is this one, with a, walking with an umbrella. This is the part with Rashmin and all, with the Shankar Netrala, all these people. You don't have to have worry for this. You are covered. Is it right? You are covered, you don't worry. The second group possibly is this one, which people like us. We have an umbrella over here. Whenever anything happens, the hospitals will save us. Very quick. But what we are concerned with is third group. They are in the periphery. They are working alone. These guys are the most susceptible persons. These guys, they are part, they, they will face the violence. They will face all the bad things, all the bad abuses. And the poor guy has to refer it to hospital after one or two days. So these are the three categories which are very important for us. So one thing I have to say, Personal experience, tell me, all of you have here, how many people have you faced litigations? Put your hands up. In the whole room, there are five only. There are only five. Litigations are not much, I'll tell you. It's not much, basically. And add to it, litigations in case of injuries are even rarer. Because this is one of the cases, because people understand that uh, that is a bad case. 
they are mentally prepared. For a cataract, litigation is much higher because the expectation is higher. So friends, my idea is to enthuse you to do these things, not to, not to restrain yourself. This is very important. Don't get caught, bogged up with the idea. You have done so many cases you have seen today. From How many cases of litigation? These were all bad cases. It was not litigated. So don't have the taboo of lit and bug of litigation in your head. Because, because of the fact, I'll tell you why, these things we all face in our life. We have faced. Now, tomorrow morning, after this day, you have a good evening with your family. Tomorrow morning, you are in the chamber. You have all these cases. If you are an operating person, you have a cataract. Lots of phacos, femtos, you have spoken. And in the middle, 12 o'clock, this child comes to you. What do you do? Touch your breast and tell me. Will you leave your cataract cases? Will you leave your 30, 40 OPDs and take care of this child because he needs you? Are we true to ourselves? This child will live for 80 years with only one eye, which you could have salvaged if you have, if you have not done those cataracts and giving him the importance. How many of you will do it here? This not be practical. It's very easy to raise your hand and I'll, I'll do it now. Will you do it? That is the question. So what is the fate of this poor boy coming? Sorry. Back to the He has to wait a long time, you are going to refer it, anesthetist may not come, tired surgeon, junior is operating. This was the case which we saw in our childhood, remember, I, because I was a person who was doing my thesis on intraocular foreign bodies in medical college. For two years I used to collect all these cases, I knew their fate and it, it was emotionally, I was very upset that this was done. So he is referred. So what is, now how serious are we? This is my question to all of you over here. How serious really are we? So medical legal issues are applicable in all stages of patient care. First, it is a diagnosis. You are liable to medical legal problems in every stage. Second is intervention. How early you intervene? And third, most important, is the rehabilitation also. Medical legal can catch you in everywhere over here. It is not only one period. So please be very careful. Because the first thing you are not doing, you are not treating me early. This is the main wrong thing which you are doing. So we have to fix our priorities. You know, this child, he's got a long expectancy. Profession deficiency will be there and it's a psychological error. Most of the injury occurs in young people, basically, in young people. You see his life, what happens? You have, have you seen? I have seen. For, I'll show you pictures. I'll, I'll show you families, what has happened after 30 years. And that is why we are there for. Please, please, I am giving you an inkling of thought. Think for yourself. So the basics of injury is act fast. This is the basics of any injury, you have to act fast. And are we acting fast? I don't know, you may have to refer, but please, please, for heaven's sake, to a proper examination. Proper sedation, proper examination you have to do. And that is the first step you have to do to prevent litigation. You have to examine. Sorry. I had learned from my younger days. Sorry. This is the one case which taught me. The patient with this eye injury, he was referred to us. But the surgeon did not see the fundus and see the fundus. So whenever a concussion injury happens, your duty is to see the fundus. This is your basically duty to see the fundus, which we possibly do not do. Or you can, may get this. You may have a retinal detachment. 
So, injuries or external injuries are very, very vulnerable to these things. So, it is your duty as a junior, everyone to see this. So, if it's a perforating eye injury, you know, I have seen cases happening on Saturday weekends in the, in the peripheries. And the patient has been just put on a bandage and sent to Calcutta after three days. Why won't we give him an antibiotic? Why can't we give him an IV antibiotic? Ask him not to squeeze, put a bad bandage. These are the basic things in a perforating eye injury can save you. So why don't we do these things? These are very simple things which we need to do. I have seen foreign bodies, you know. Just seeing a foreign body, you refer him. You know you're referring, before referring, why don't you do a straight x-ray and confirm whether foreign body is... This saves a lot of time for the final surgeon. This saves a lot of things for the final surgeon. I hope you agree. This helps a lot of time. So these are the very small things which you should do. Sorry. This is, this is very important. If you want to refer, record reasons for referral. This is very important for the medical legal aspect. Why are you referring? You may say it's a lack of facility, I don't have that. But you must record it that you are referring because of this. You have to record parties' refusal to be treated by you. This is also a very important part in the medical legal system. You have to record the party's refusal. These are very small things, but I am telling you, gentlemen and ladies, this carries a big thing in legality. So, act with a sense of urgency, check proper facility, keep appropriate medical records, and most, most important, keep a comprehensive medical discharge certificate. Especially when you're working alone, this is very important. Because you know, the comprehensive discharge certificate prescription is an evidence in court. Because in you, you're not worried about, I'm not worried about litigation for myself. It is my, because I have to go to court. So we have to go to court, remember that. I have been going, going to court a number of times. And you are maybe involved in a part of the compensation of the patient. These are all very important terms. So I suggest if you have an injury case, keep separate files for it. Because I will tell you why. And once is violence in industrial work, workplace injury, it is very, very important. So all this acid burns, all this bomb blast injuries, and one fine day after 10 years, you will have this letter from court. I was summoned to Sessions Court, Purva Vendup, Tomlup, after seven years. I do not know what case it was. The evidence produced in court was this, my prescription somewhere. So it is very, very important that you keep your prescriptions because you won't remember and you will be in the table in front of the judge you will be bombarded by questions from both parties and you don't know anything this is a very very embarrassing situation my friends for doctors so this is my request in any injury cases whether you treat or not keep a record of this case do you want to say something so this was the patient which was uh, I was called for. Fortunately, I have a record, dislocated lens with sphincter rupture. And this lady, the next case was very interesting. This was dislocated, family feud. I was called to the court to give evidence because she was claiming a part of the house from the family. So this was the thing. So these things have been faced by us. Preferable to do counseling yourself. I know you are busy man. The worst thing for doctors is pretend busy. Why are we busy? Because of patients. I will tell you a story told by the famous actor Ajitesh Mandavadda famous. He told me. Why are we busy? Because patients come to see, because people come to see our theatre. Without, without those people we are nothing. So why do we claim to be busy? We are busy because of the patients only, nothing else. So this is also your patient. So busy in the court of law doesn't count for a doctor. And your main thing, your staff should be compassionate. All the, there's been a study, 70% of litigations are due to bad behavior of the staff. 
telling the doctor is busy, he will never meet you. Sir is very busy. So this, remember, this is a very important issue. Avoid delay, follow accepted medical practices, be updated by new laws. This is very important also. In general, a doctor's innocence is presumed in court. The complainant has to prove negligence. It's a very important point. Unsuccessful surgery is not medical negligence. A success, uh, surgery may be unsuccessful. It is not a medical negligence. This is an important point. I'll tell you one of the stories. This is for myself, not for you, I think. They were, she was 25, 7 years old for a car accident, 8 years ago. This was his eye was. They were, she after 10 years of surgery. This is how his eye was. Similarly, this was a Riju. Please follow these cases. These are very important. He was a child of 7 years, going with his mother, Shanti Niketan, got a thorn injury, came back, we repaired in, in the middle of the night. This is Riju growing up, he was like this. This was his eye after 17 years. Riju go, now grown up, being handsome. We go to Singapore, he treats us. This is another child, Kollol. He's working in the IT sector. This is his eyes. You know, many eyes do not look good, but they're very functional. Forget, remember that. They may not look good for you. They may not be that acceptable look, but they're functional. This was a boy, Biplob. This is Biplob's after injury. So, are we not competent to repair a continental wound when we can do such complicated procedures? I think it is in the mind. It is not question, but maybe we can salvage some of the eyes with our earnest desire, as told by the great. And we can also be part of the lifestyle pattern of these people. By our, by, we can be a part and change their future also. That is what Oscar Wilde has said in the importance of being earnest. Patients who like their doctors don't sue, even when their lawyer tells them to sue. We have got evidence of that. So we, in the Oriental people, be, always believe in the process of friendship, brotherhood, kinship, and at the end of the day, we are realizing with my age is spirituality. This is very. This is one of the most important subjects. So the journey goes on. Now you see, all these children have grown up. They have got families now. They come to us after 15, 30 years with their children in their. They just want to see the doctor who saved their father. It is not me. They come with their families. Riju, he's married the last month. When I go there, he touches my feet and tells his wife, please do the same thing because you can see me because of this gentleman. I do not think any money can give this to a doctor. I do not think any cars, any Rolls Royce, any Audi can give this. This is the greatest thing which a doctor's desire. And that comes my favorite song. I can sing now from Sound of Music. I think Rajesh knows. Nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could. For somewhere in my youth of childhood, I can have some something good. This is for me, not for you. And for all Pradudda, Kajullah, for all the seniors of us, this is for us, Dada. So the choice is yours. If you will treat that young child and give him the picture what he sees today, or you will continue with your normal process, you know, normal surgery doesn't make you a big doctor. It is all the odd things you do in life that makes you big. So this is your choice, gentlemen, whichever way you go. I have my priorities, you have your priorities. You think for yourself. And we finish with the great Rabindranath, which I was reading Gitali the other day. Kajalda will vouch. Forgive my anguished heart, which trembles and hesitates in its service. It was written in 1914 in Gitali. This is one of the best words which we have. Also, this gentleman has written lots of big words. We don't understand. So, at the end of the day, thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abhijit, for such an enlightening discussion. Wala, wala, wala. Kunta, everything has to be written. Everything has to be written. 
because we all learned a lot of things not the ophthalmology more of the philosophy of life and the way he portrays his his knowledge about rabindranath is phenomenal uh, we will uh, there is another surprise for today there is another person who is uh, you know has done a phenomenal job for rabindranath and who got awarded today so will come for that so i'm just stopping it there so you all be here for that so before that probably we just need to uh, do a routine job but this is this is most important part of it would like to uh, recognize uh, the effort of our all the guest speakers who has come here all the way dr rashmin gandhi sir please uh, there's a small memento and the test of west bengal sweet as well i'll request dr uh, sir yasin sir dr yasin to please do the honor and for just a few hours program he has to got up at 2 am and he has flown all the way from hyderabad and before anyone has reached this place he has reached this place so he needs a big round of applause for that as well uh would like to call dr tarjani she is young and dynamic lady from lb prasad hyderabad and uh, she was sharing that she has a lot of sweet memories about west bengal society earlier also and just to give uh, a brief introduction that uh, she is daughter of dr jogesh shah and uh, uh, with sir he she has come earlier also and she has enjoyed now she is enlightening us with ophthalmology i'll request uh, shekhar the dr shekhar sharka please uh, to do the honor for for her in fact she is born and brought up in a ophthalmology family her uh, elder brother is also a veterinary surgeon her sister in law is a corneal surgeon father is an ophthalmologist and husband is ophthalmologist and he is a vr surgeon this is test of west bengal sweet without that you cannot go back would like to request one of our good friend dr vaskar srinivasan vaskar uh, there was a there was a uh, uh, when we were together at shankanetrala uh, there was a uh, study room called consultant study room that was in short was csr and we have converted that study room to bsr vaskar study room because he was agar kisi jagah pe vaskar ko nahi mila to you could go there and find out that's what till 3 am he was present there and from there he used to go for sleep for 4 hours and then again uh, present at sn by 8 that was his you know initial days i am sure that he is doing still the same thing and uh, i'd request dr pn biswas sir please do the honor for uh, maskar and uh, he is now probably the, all the corneal surgeons they will they will vouch with me uh, to him the that he is now one of the international person for ocular surface uh, uh, with his presentation publication and all the research work
and with his small beard we used to pull him that he was for OOKP, he was looking like Dr. Falsanelli who was, who was inventor of uh, OOKP. So, uh, Bhaskar, thank you, thank you for coming all the way. Now we have uh, our Dr. Rajarshi, Dr. Rajarshi Banerjee. I just saw now, Dr. Yeah. And uh, Rajarshi, thank you, thank you so much for you know, the, tolerating us for a few hours of ophthalmology. I'll request Dr. Uh, Parag Mukherjee. Parag, the, please do the honor for Dr. Uh, Rajarshi. Sweet is not new for you, but again, this is, this is something will bring a sweet memory to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll request Dr. Kostov Roy. Please, please. The, these two maxillofacial surgeons has, you know, put a special flavor to the to the today's program. Because and the credit goes to Dr. Rajesh as well because to bring them here and and uh, and to uh, do it. I'll request Dr. K. P. Ghosh Kajalda, please do the honor for uh, Dr. Kostov. And this is the, the aesthetic surgery is probably is intermingling with uh, oculoplasty surgery. So this is very uh, uh, small area of overlapping is now, but probably in, in recent future there will be a lot of overlapping and a lot of, you know, working together will, will be more, much more needed. So we need their help and they will need probably our help in future as, as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kostov. Please, please, please join us. And now, what I was mentioning there, the most pleasant part today, I to do this. Uh, this is this is we feel proud and honored to be the ophthalmologist of West Bengal, and to be his junior colleague. So to do this honor, I will request Dr. Mohua. Mohuadi, please uh, do the job for all of us. আজকের শ্রদ্ধা জ্ঞাপন অনুষ্ঠানে সকলকে নমস্কার জানিয়ে শুরু করছি আমাদের শ্রদ্ধার্ঘ ওএসডব্লিউবি তরফ থেকে ডক্টর পূর্ণেন্দু সরকার মহাশয়কে বিকাশ সরকার মহাশয়কে এবার একটু পরিচয়টা সেরে নেওয়া যাক চক্ষু চিকিৎসক ডক্টর পূর্ণেন্দু বিকাশ সরকারের শৈশব ও পড়াশোনা উত্তর চব্বিশ পরগনার গোবরডাঙায় উনিশশো উনসত্তর সালে মৌলিক বৈজ্ঞানিক মডেল তৈরি করে স্যার সত্যেন বসুর কাছ থেকে প্রথম পুরস্কার পেয়েছিলেন ডাক্তারি পড়াশোনা কলকাতা মেডিকেল কলেজে উনিশশো সালে স্থাপন করেছেন চোখের আধুনিক চিকিৎসা কেন্দ্র সল্ট লেক আই ফাউন্ডেশন ডক্টর সরকার প্রথম থেকেই নিজস্ব সফটওয়্যারের সাহায্যে কম্পিউটার জেনারেটেড ডাটা রেকর্ড আর প্রিন্টেড প্রেসক্রিপশান ব্যবহার করেছেন এবং এখনও করে চলেছেন উনিশশো ছিয়ানব্বই সালে তিনি প্রথম ক্যাসেট থেকে গানের অ্যানালগ ট্র্যাকগুলিকে ডিজিটাল কনভার্সন করা শুরু করেন দু সালে আনন্দ পাবলিশার্সের সিগনেট প্রেস থেকে প্রকাশিত হয়েছে তার বিপুল আয়তনের গবেষণা গ্রন্থ গীতবিতান তথ্যভাণ্ডার যেখানে দুই মলাটের মধ্যে ধরা রয়েছে সমস্ত রবীন্দ্রনাথের গানের প্রাপ্ত যাবতীয় তথ্য গীতবিতান তথ্যভাণ্ডার বইটির জন্য ডক্টর পূর্ণেন্দু বিকাশ সরকারকে চোদ্দোশো উনতিরিশ সালের আনন্দ পুরস্কার প্রদান করা হয়েছে বইটির অভিনব বৈশিষ্ট্য বইয়ের পাতা থেকে কিউ আর কোডের মাধ্যমে পাঠক নিজের স্মার্টফোনে সরাসরি গান শুনতে পারবেন এজন্য ইউটিউব বা অন্য কোনো মাধ্যমের প্রয়োজন হবে না এবার আসি আমাদের শ্রদ্ধা জ্ঞাপনে রবীন্দ্রনাথ অনাদি অসীম অনন্ত রবীন্দ্রনাথের গান সীমার মাঝে অসীম जीवन नाना मुहूर्ते आश्रय रवींद्रसंगीत विषय पाठक आग्रह तीमाहीन डर पूर्णेन्दु विकास सरकार गीतवितान तथ्यभाण्डार एक श्रमसाध्य क्ज यही ग्रंथे गीतवितान समस्त गान प्राप्त जावतियों तथ्यगुली के एम भाव संकलित कराते जेको गान नाना खबर मुहूर्ते ही जेने सम्भव नाट्यान्तर्गत सुरारोपित संलापगल आलदा विभाग 
রবীন্দ্রসঙ্গীতের কালানুক্রমিক বিন্যাসের সঙ্গে সঙ্গে বিভিন্ন কাব্যগ্রন্থের প্রকাশের সম্পর্ক ও নানা তথ্য গীত সমৃদ্ধ রবীন্দ্র গ্রন্থ পুনরাবৃত্ত গান এবং ভাঙা গানের বিস্তারিত তালিকা আলোচ্য গ্রন্থটিকে সমৃদ্ধ করেছে কাজটির পরিধি বিশাল আমাদের নিরন্তর চিন রবীন্দ্রচর্চার জগতে এটি একটি জরুরি কাজ হিসেবে গণ্য হবে বলে বিশ্বাস করি রবীন্দ্র প্রেমীদের জন্য অবশ্য সংগ্রহযোগ্য আকর গ্রন্থ গীতবিতান তথ্যভাণ্ডার বছর দশেক আগে গীতবিতান আর্কাইভ নামে একটি ডিভিডি প্রকাশ করে আমাদের চমৎকৃত করেছিলেন এই প্রথিত যশা চক্ষু চিকিৎসক ডক্টর পূর্ণেন্দু বিকাশ সরকার মহাশয় এত ব্যস্ত একজন চক্ষু চিকিৎসক সকালে বিকালে যিনি অগণ্য মানুষের রোগ নিরাময়ের কাজে ব্যাপৃত থাকেন এমন একটি শ্রমসাধ্য আর সময়সাধ্য গবেষণা কাজ কেমনভাবে করে উঠতে পারলেন সে কথা ভেবে আমরা অনেকেই বিস্মিত হয়েছিলাম খবর নিয়ে জানা গিয়েছিল রাত নটার পর চিকিৎসা কাজ থেকে সম্পূর্ণ বিরতি নিয়ে তিনি মগ্ন হতেন রবীন্দ্র চর্চায় তিনটে পর্যন্ত চলত সেই চর্চা সেইভাবে সম্পূর্ণ হতে পেরেছিল গীতবিতান আর্কাইভের কাজ যা মলিন মলিনতা ক্লিষ্ট কর্মবিমুখ বাঙালিদের কাছে অসাধ্য সাধন এরকম আরও অনেক কাজ উনি সুস্থ শরীরে ও মনে করতে পারুন এটাই আমাদের এই মুহূর্তের ঐকান্তিক প্রার্থনা এই অমৃত সুধারস ধারা শত মুখে প্রকাশিত হয়ে আমাদের ইন্দ্রিয় সকলকে অমৃতের স্বাদ এনে দিক এই কামনা করি ধন্যবাদ এখন আমি মঞ্চে দেখে নেব আমাদের সেক্রেটারি ডক্টর দেবাশিস দাসকে মানপত্রটি পড়ার জন্য স্যার আপনি প্লিজ আসুন ডক্টর পূর্ণন্দী সরকার আপনি ম্যাডাম আপনিও আসুন প্লিজ অরূপ চক্রবর্তী স্যার আছেন নেই আজ যে মানপত্রটি আমরা শ্রীযুক্ত পূর্ণেন্দু বিকাশ সরকারকে প্রদান করব আমি সেই মানপত্রটি একটু পাঠ করব মাননীয় সু শ্রীযুক্ত পূর্ণেন্দু বিকাশ সরকার রবীন্দ্রনাথ আমাদের আত্মার প্রতিবিম্ব আমাদের চলমান জীবনের প্রসারিত ছায়া আমাদের যাবতীয় জাগতিক উপলব্ধিকে আমরা ক্রমাগত যাচাই করে নিতে থাকি রবীন্দ্র ভাবনায় ও রবীন্দ্র চেতনায় এই ভাব নিয়ে আপনি আপনার গ্রন্থ রচনার সূত্রপাত ঘটিয়েছেন বাঙালি জাতির যাত্রাভিমানের যে সুবিশাল অংশ জুড়ে রবীন্দ্রনাথের গান বিরাজিত তার স্বমহিমায় আপনি সেই মহাসঙ্গীত কোষকে পুনরায় আবিষ্কার করেছেন আপনার নিরল শ্রম মেধা এবং নিষ্ঠা গীতবিতান তত্ত্বভাণ্ডার গ্রন্থটিকে বিশিষ্টতার পর্যায়ে উন্নীত করেছে এই গ্রন্থে উন্মোচিত হয়েছে রবীন্দ্রনাথের গানের এক অনন্য ইতিহাস তথ্যের এক সুদীর্ঘ বৃত্তান্ত এই গ্রন্থের ঐতিহাসিক মূল্য অপরিসীম আপনি অগণিত রবীন্দ্র অনুরোগী চিন্তার বিস্তারে আলো এবং উপলব্ধি সঞ্চার করেছেন শুধুমাত্র রবীন্দ্রসঙ্গীত চর্চার ঐতিহ্য শুধু নয় বাংলা সাহিত্য এবং সংস্কৃতির ক্ষেত্রে আপনার এই অপরিসীম অবদানকে ভাবিকাল কৃতজ্ঞ চিত্তে স্মরণ করবে একটি মহান কর্তব্যবোধ আপনার গবেষণা কার্যে প্রতিফলিত হয়েছে বর্তমান সময়ে এই বিরল রবীন্দ্রচর্চার ধারা আপনার এই বিপুলায়তন গ্রন্থে পরিলক্ষিত হয়েছে রবীন্দ্রনাথের গানের চর্চা তথা বাংলা সাহিত্যের ভবিষ্যৎ কালপর্বে যা এক চিরস্থায়ী ঐশ্বর্য রূপে চিহ্নিত থাকবে চোদ্দোশো উনত্রিশ বঙ্গাব্দের আনন্দ পুরস্কার সম্মাননা আপনার মতন প্রথিত যশা মানুষের প্রাপ্তিতে আমাদের প্রতিটি শুভানুধ্যায়ী সভ্য ও সভ্যার আন্তরিক অভিনন্দন ও ভালোবাসার মেলবন্ধন গ্রহণ করুন নমস্কার আনতে এখন আমি মঞ্চে ডেকে নেব ডক্টর কাজল প্রসাদ ঘোষ স্যার ডক্টর অভিজিৎ ঘোষ স্যার আর দেবাশিস 
ওনাদের মেমেন্টো দেওয়ার জন্য হ্যাঁ ওটাই আমি ভাবছিলাম বোঝে অ্যাবাউট হোয়াট ব্যাপারটা হ্যাঁ মানে ইংলিশে বলে দিতে পারছি না for may i attention please i know there are many people who do not understand bengali here so it is just uh, dr punendu sarkar is a very able ophthalmologist practicing for uh, in salt lake area so he is one of his passions is rovindranath and after he was doing all his work in the clinic he used to go in the night and work for rovindranath's songs compiling of different songs and yes okay, written a book regarding all the songs of rabindranath when in a one click you will be knowing the history of the song the ragas and all the inform relevant information this is a in human charge human charge task which he has done and for this in 16th of april he received an award which is a very prestigious award called anando award from anandavajar patrika group which is a very important award he has received it for the last latest book which is there rubindranath tottva bhandar he has created a book where you, if you go on reading the book you will be reading the history and with every song he has a qr code and if you qr code it in the mobile you can hear that song itself so it's a wonderful work which we have done and we are all proud and we are acknowledging his feet over here please everyone give him a standing ovation please namaskar shobai ke eta ekebare shogri appayan hoye gelo anand puraskar power power jothariti amake nana jaygay jete hocche ebong sambardhana nite hocche kintu ajke je sambardhana paa gelo etar onubhuti ta ei rokom যে আমার পরিবারের কেউ যদি একটা ভালো কাজ করে ধরুন ভালো রেজাল্ট করলো কেউ ভালো ভালো কিছু আর করলো তার যে আনন্দ আমরা পরিবারে সকলে ভাগ করে নিই আমার অপথানিক পরিবারের বন্ধুরা দাদারা ভাইরা যে ভাবে সেটা ভাগ করে নিল যে ভালোবাসায় তার তুলনা নেই কোনো জায়গায় আমি এই ধরনের আনন্দ পাইনি সকলকে অনেক ধন্যবাদ শুধু একটা কথা বলি গীতবিধান তত্ত্বভাণ্ডারটা একটি একটি একাডেমিক বই যারা রবীন্দ্রনাথ নিয়ে গবেষণা বা কাজকর্ম করতে ভালোবাসেন তাদের ডেফিনেটলি ভালো লাগবে কিন্তু আমার কাজটা হচ্ছে যে আমি করি তার মূল মূল ভাবনাটা হচ্ছে রবীন্দ্রনাথকে নতুন প্রজন্মের সঙ্গে একটা যোগসূত্র তৈরি করে দেওয়া এবং সহজে গীতবিধান তত্ত্বভাণ্ডার যেমন অনেক বইয়ের খবর একটা বইয়ের মধ্যে আমি সংকলিত করেছি যার জন্য আনন্দ পুরস্কার আমাকে দেওয়া হয়েছে কিন্তু একইভাবে আর একটা কাজ আমি আপনাদের বলে রাখি সেটা হচ্ছে রবীন্দ্র গানের অন্তরালে আমরা গান শোনবার জন্য আজকাল ইউটিউব বা ডিজিটাল মাধ্যম ব্যবহার করি 
কিন্তু গান শোনার অন্য একটা উপায় যেটা আমরা করেছি যে বইয়ের মধ্যে গান এই যে বইটা দেখা যাচ্ছে এতে দুশো পাঁচটা রবীন্দ্রনাথের গানের তো খবর আছে গল্প আছে এই গল্প পড়তে পড়তে আমি এখানে কিউ আর কোড স্ক্যান করে গানটা সরাসরি আমাদের ক্লাউড থেকে শুনতে পারবো নট ইন দ্য ইউটিউব নট ইন দ্য ডিজিটাল ফর্ম ইট ইজ এ ক্লাউড যত বছর আমরা বইটার হাতে থাকবে তত বছর আমরা সরাসরি গান শুনতে পারবো সুতরাং এই যে গান শোনার একটা নতুন ধারণা ইয়ং জেনারেশান যারা রবীন্দ্রনাথ থেকে বিচ্যুত হয়ে যাচ্ছে তারা যখন এইটা কিউ আর কোডটা স্ক্যান করবে বিকজ দে আর ভেরি মাচ মোবাইল সেবি রবীন্দ্রনাথের গান তাদের কানে পৌঁছাবে এবং কিছুটা রবীন্দ্রনাথের সঙ্গে তাদের একটা সম্পৃক্ততা তৈরি হবে এটাই আমার কাজের বৈশিষ্ট্য এবং আমি আশা করি আগামী দিনে রবীন্দ্রনাথকে আমরা আরও আরও বহু মানুষের কাছে আমরা সহজে পৌঁছে দিতে পারবো এই পদ্ধতিতে নমস্কার নমস্কার নাও আর শর্ট ভিডিও শোয়িং দ্য রিসিভাল অফ আনন্দ পুরস্কার ফোরটিন টোয়েন্টি নাইন প্লিজ স্টার্ট দ্য ভিডিও আনন্দের পরিশ্রম দুই যেন একাকার হয়ে গেল এবারে আনন্দ পুরস্কারে অনেক পরিশ্রম করে তুলে আনা তথ্যকেই জানানো হল আনন্দ কুর্নিশ চোদ্দোশো উনত্রিশের আনন্দ পুরস্কারে সম্মানিত হল চক্ষু বিশেষজ্ঞ পূর্ণেন্দু বিকাশ সরকারের ধৃতবিতান ভাণ্ডার পেশায় চোখের চিকিৎসক হলেও নেশায় রবীন্দ্র প্রেমী চিকিৎসক রবীন্দ্রসঙ্গীতের অতলে ডুব দিয়ে তুলে এনেছেন বিপুল তথ্য ভাণ্ডার ধৃতবিতানের বিভিন্ন গান কখনো রচনা কি তার উৎসগ্রন্থ স্বরলিপিকার থেকে গানের লিপিকার সব তথ্যই মিলবে গীতবিতান ভাণ্ডারের দুই মলাটে Mrs. Bornali Sharkar to for a recital. Hello, hello. I am a little bit of 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 a little bit. সামনে আঙি নাতে তোমার একটারাটি হাতে তুমি সুর লাগিয়ে নাচ পথে করতে খেলা আমার কখন হলো বেলা আমার শাস্তে দিল তাই ইচ্ছে হোথায় নাবি কিন্তু ঘরে বন্ধ চাবি আমার বেরুতে পথে নাই বাড়ি ফেরার তরে তোমায় কে উনা তারা করে তোমার নাই কোনো পাঠশালা সমস্ত দিন কাটে তোমার পথে ঘাটে মাঠে তোমার ঘরে তিনি তালা তাই তো তোমার নাচে আমার প্রাণ যেন ভাই বাঁচে আমার মন যেন পায় ছুটি ও গো তোমার নাচে যেন ঢেউয়ের দোলা আছে ঝড়ে গাছের লুটোপুটি অনেক দূরের দেশ আমার চোখে লাগায় রেশ যখন তোমায় দেখি পথে দেখতে যে পায় মন যেন নাম না জানা বোন কোন পথ হারা পর্বতে হঠাৎ মনে লাগে যেন অনেক দিনের আগে আমি অমনি ছিলেন ছাড়া সেদিন গেল ছেড়ে আমার পথ নিল কে কেড়ে আমার হারালো এক তারা কে নিল গোটেনি আমায় পাঠশালাতে এনে আমার এলো গুরু মশাই মন সদা যার চলে যত ঘর ছাড়াদের দলে তারে ঘরে কেন বসায় কৌ তো আমায় ভাই তোমার গুরু মশাই নাই আমি যখন দেখি ভেবে বুঝতে পারি খাঁটি তোমার বুকের এক তারাটি তোমায় ওই তো পড়া দেবে তোমার কানে কানে ওরি গুনগুনানি গানে তোমায় কোন কথা যে কয় সব কি তুমি বোঝো তারই মানে যেন খোঁজো কেবল ফিরে ভুবনময় ওরি কাছে বুঝি আছে তোমার নাচের পুঁজি 
তোমার খেপা পায়ের ছুটি ওড়ি সুরের বলে তোমার গলার মালা দোলে তোমার দোলে মাথার ঝুটি মন যে আমার পালায় তোমার একটার আপার শালায় আমায় ভুলিয়ে দিতে পারো নেবে আমায় সাথে এসব পণ্ডিতেরই হাতে আমায় কেন সবাই মারো ভুলিয়ে দিয়ে পড়া আমায় শেখাও সুরে গড়া তোমার তালা ভাঙার পাঠ আর কিছু না চাই যেন আকাশখানা পাই আর পালিয়ে যাবার মাঠ দূরে কেন আছো দারে রাগল ধরে নাচো বাউলা মারি এইখানে সমস্ত দিন ধরে যেন মাতন ওঠে ভোরে তোমার ভাঙন লাগা গানে Now I would like to hand over to Dr. Rupak for the vote of thanks. Thank you. Shishbalai Monta Bhalo Hoye Jai Jodhi Erakom Kichu Shona Jai. So I would like to thank on behalf of OSWB to all the delegates who has come here and spending with us on, on a Sunday afternoon. And a special thanks to all our guest speakers who has actually a thank is always a less for whatever the tremendous job they have done for you know OSWB and enlightening and contributing to the uh, academics. I would like to uh, thank uh, our uh, uh, supporter and partner CIPLA for you know helping us for organizing this session today. I would like to thank our audiovisual uh, uh, Giri, Srimanto Giri and his team. So they have always supported, uh, supporting for us. And uh, Shogato for uh, camera. And uh, I would like to thank Sabhumi and Rangman Sabhumi team for helping us organizing this show with a grand way. And none other than Apurbo and uh, where, uh, are kya Giri, Giri, na Giri to achi Apurbo. Sushantoda or yeah, Shantanu. So all three were actually the the harmony behind the whole uh, whole you know orchestra. You can see it off. I would like to thank all of you once again, and please join us for the lunch today. Enjoy the Bengali cuisine of West Bengal. <laughs>